Have you ever listened to like an audiobook or something or a podcast on like three quarter speed? Whoever it is that you're listening to, they sound drunk. It's hilarious. <laughs> Try it sometime if you've never done that. I know we're I, on like the pre-roll here. Everybody listening, if you have not done that, maybe try with this video. You're watching this video. Put us on half speed and we're going to sound drunk. It's, it's awesome. the only time you'll ever hear me drunk. Um, I can't do that because I'm listening to my audiobook old school style. Remember, I have 28 discs <laughs> of Game of Thrones sitting right. in my you passenger got your, seat. You got your fanny pack full of CDs. Dude, I, this is even bigger than a fanny pack, man. It's like the size of two bricks stuck together. Is your is your uh, Walkman CD shockproof? Do you have the jogger version? Uh, I did. So it won't skip back, your CD? <laughs> back, back when I had those Sony behind the head headphones, you bet I did. Ooh, yeah, I remember those. Yeah, man, that was oh my it. Gosh. So great. So great. <laughs> anyway. Oh, we're doing a pen cast, aren't we? Okay, let's get yeah, why into don't, it. Why don't we just make this thing happen? Let's do it. All right. Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to episode number 60 of the Goulet Pencast. Nice round number today. Where fountain pens are still a thing, I am Brian Goulet. I'm Drew Brown. And we are here from Goulet Pens to deliver this casual and informal, tangential and extraneous, superfluous and extemporaneous fountain pen show, where we talk about what's going on at the Goulet Pen Company and in our fountain pen lives. In today's show, we're going to talk about how clean is clean enough for your pens, what well-behaved means for ink, why fountain pens are called fountain, and how that works in other languages besides English, uh, if scratchy nibs will just kind of naturally heal themselves over time. Uh, we have a special guest spot with David Parker from Fig Boot on Pens. And we have a hypothetical about our dream pen. And we're going to be spotlighting the new Delta 39 plus one, among other banter. Should be a good time had by all, us in particular. We're going to kick it off with feedback. Brian, I admittedly have some some heavy duty feedback this episode. I see it. The, it's uh, like the first. There's like a wall of text here. Yeah, yeah. There's 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 some talkings happening, or there will be. So, uh, Puneet, all right, all right. Puneet emailed us, and uh, we had spoken about uh, Puneet back in episode 16 because he was transcribing all three Lord of the Rings books in fountain pen. So we Which had talked about epic. what to do with your fountain pen. We talked about transcribing some of your favorite books, and uh, at the time, Puneet was working on them. He has since finished them, all Get three out. Lord of the Rings books in fountain pen, 100% done. So from episode 16 to episode 60, way to go, my friend. Um, and wow. he emailed me and was like, hey, I couldn't have done this without you. I'm like, wait, hold on, hold on. Yeah, what, 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 you what, definitely what, could have. We didn't do, do anything. I, 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 he might not have said that, but he did say we were a big help. I'm like, uh, that, that's awesome. Congratulations. But uh how? <laughs> what, 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 what did we do? <laughs> what did we do? So I was like, did you just listen to us a lot? And he replied with this. Yes, I listened very regularly. I think that if I would have gone on my own with writing and fountain pens as a hobby, it would have been very hard to stay engaged and enthusiastic about it. Every week, I drew a lot of energy from you and Brian and your enthusiasm. Also, the way you engage with the community, feedback, Q&A, etc., made me feel like part of something. That's not to say the hobby itself isn't fun and engaging on its own, but it's an order of magnitude better with what you guys do. Thank you so much. That's awesome. And I followed this up with a question for Puneet. I said, hey, you've got some pretty unique perspective here. Having written a ton, what was the most comfortable fountain pen that you used? Mm -hmm. And Puneet's number one happened to be the best brown pen out there, Brian, the Pilot Custom 823. Not a surprise. No, a it's surprise. a great pen. A uh, pen. Second, second was the Edison Collier, which we have mentioned in previous pencasts about its comfort factor. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that these are both not surprising, but very, very good options. If you wanted a large ink capacity or a very comfortable writing experience for a long period of time, I think Puni picked two really good ones. No doubt they were uh, his favorites for a reason. Um, and this next one is a bit wordy, but it, I felt like it did deserve to be read in its entirety. This comment is from Megan. And uh, Megan starts off with, what's it called when you talk at the pen cast on your screen, but don't leave a comment on it? 
So she decided to leave a comment. Uh, <laughs> you guys are fantastic and you should know about it. So here goes. I've always been a stationary nerd, but only got into fountain pens in October 2021. Now I have 25. Diving into fancy pens helped distract me from a recent series of life-changing events. March to June 2020, I had COVID and couldn't work. March 2021, I became a below-the-knee amputee. In December 2021, I got divorced. Mm. Fountain pens and the fountain pen community have helped me by going, by, helped me by going, uh, helped keep me going, sorry, by inspiring me with camaraderie and pretties to keep writing and doing art. Yay for the internet and sedentary activities. Mm. Silver lining. Should we ever cross paths at a show? I hope we do. I'll be easily recognizable even if my handle isn't showing. I'll be the one in the sweet galaxy-themed prosthetic leg and or bright orange wheelchair. If you gotta have it, it should be cool as hell, right? Right. Same concept obviously applies to stationery. So finding the pen cast was awesome for me mentally, but maybe terribly for my bank account. I have zero regrets and approximately 117 happies. So many thank yous and never changes to you. Turkey hammock for life. P.S. <laughs> I made the same faces as Drew while Brian discussed his ideal pizza. PPS, <laughs> Brian's deep dives are an excellent, are, are excellent. Please continue giving me all the information. Wow. Thank you so very much, Megan. That was a wow. heck, heck of a share. Thank you for spending the time in order to share that with us. That's uh, incredible, uh, keeping that level of positivity. And if we could have played the infinitesimally small role, we are beyond honored by that. So thank you for that. Absolutely. Echo all of that. That's your resilience is very inspiring, Megan. And the fact you give us any credit is humbling, honestly. All right. I have less feedback than Drew. So whew, that was heavy. That was heavy, but good. Um, got one from Ian that says, hi, Brian and Drew. I dabbled in the hobby briefly about a decade ago, then didn't actually get into uh, get Oh my gosh, get into it until probably a couple of months ago. Wow, that is some dedicated lurking going on That's there. a comeback. Uh, I really wanted to thank you for the many videos. I know it takes a lot of time to put together. Oh yes, it does. Um, but like you said many times, I'm the only one in my friend group who's even remotely interested in fountain pens. Having all the videos from one place with the same person or people makes it feel like you have a friend who's just answering a FaceTime call every time I have a question. Thanks for all you do. That's awesome. Yes. I'm, I'm also one of the only <laughs> one of the only people who doesn't work at Goulet Pens who has interest in fountain pens. I have, I have a couple who, who've dabbled, but yeah, that's a very familiar feeling we all have, Ian, and that's uh, part of the beauty of this internet thing that we have. One of us. Yeah, that's really cool. Um, and then, and a little teaser here, actually speaking about like how much time it takes videos. So Drew and I just shot like four more videos that we're gonna be publishing out over coming. And I have one about like getting back into fountain pens. So Ian, you're gonna eat that one up, though you've been watching videos for 10 years. So I think you have a pretty solid foundation. I don't think your learning curve is gonna be that long. Anyway, uh, last piece of feedback here is from Andrea or Andrea, not sure how you pronounce it. Could be either way. Um, Andrea says, bumper pool, OMG, I haven't, thought about my grandparents' bumper pool, bumper pool table in years. Thanks for that flood of happy memories. I don't know how many people have bumper pool tables. I don't know how popular it is, but I don't know. It's hard to say bump, bumper, bumper, bump, bumper <laughs> pool. Bumper pool. Bumper pool. <laughs> you, you, bumper, flub, you flubbed bumper, on bumper that. Bumper I'm like, pool. bumper pool, bumper pool. I can't. Yeah, my grandparents' bumper pool. <laughs> <laughs> bumper pool. Bumper pool, bumper <laughs> pool. Bump. Yeah, that's I a good tongue twister, right? I can't bump. tell if I'm bump, just... Bump, 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 well, that's bump, the thing. Bump, bump. I don't... <laughs> what, what I don't doing? know. I don't know if I'm actually uh, not able to say it because it's hard to say or if I just sound so stupid I'm laughing at myself and can't finish. Maybe a little both. Maybe a little oh both. Oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> What's so hard, Drew? Bumper pull. <laughs> no, I can't help but say it's sing-songy now. I know. Oh, my gosh. Good okay. stuff. All right, let's move it along. Next up, we got some new stuff to talk about. All right, so there's plenty of new things. A lot of stuff coming soon. A lot of stuff coming in the wings. Summertime is usually a little bit slower for the uh, manufacturers coming out with stuff. So we've had, we've had a pretty good trickle of new things, but um, 
definitely a lot on the horizon. So we have a couple of new things that have actually come in that we'll talk about. First one being the Delta 39 plus one. I won't go on and on and on about this right now because we are gonna make it the pen spotlight for today. But uh, this is the comeback Delta pen. So Delta has been, I mean, they were gone. They were legit gone for five years, something like that. And uh, now they're back. So they call it the 39 plus one because they announced officially that the company was starting back up last year. And then they came up with this pen for their 40th anniversary, but because they sort of came back last year and then kind of added one year for 40th anniversary, so they called it 39 plus one. I don't know, kind of interesting way to go about it. Um, but it's a limited edition pen, 399 of them. Um, it's their kind of reboot Delta pen, gold nib. Uh, they have an 18 karat and a 14 karat version. So seven different nib sizes on this thing. Yeah, a lot of options, even though it's only 399 pens. So that's kind of cool. Is there any um, weird options or they're just like extra fine, fine, and then up to um, extra some fine. Stubs. So on the 18K, it's extra fine through broad with a 1.1 stub, and then they are doing a flexible extra fine and fine on the 14K. Oh. Yeah. So I haven't used the 14K ones yet. And these are Yovo nibs, right? I don't know. I don't know for certain how these nibs are being made. Again, because Delta's like rebooting, we have to like go and find all this information about how they're doing it. I don't know if these are old nibs that they had that they're reusing. I don't know if they're having them made new. I, I don't know the situation, but we'll try and find that out. But anyway, so this just kind of got on our radar recently. We've known they were coming back for a while, but this pen is uh, relatively new to us. Um, I did get to see it, hold it in my hand. It's nice, the fit and finish is great. The material is great. So it's a true celluloid, the nitro celluloid. So this is old vintage celluloid that they had that they had used on previous Delta pens. So um, kind of a little bit of a throwback. That's probably part of why it's limited in nature is because actually of the material, there's, there's, they're not making it anymore. So that's pretty cool. Any hardcore Delta collectors, you'll probably, maybe you'll recognize it, um, but it's like a brown and kind of a gold, uh, little flecked kind of a thing. So it looks really cool. And it's got that nice like feel that celluloid has. And then the trim on this is gold vermeil, which is something that you hear about a little bit, not a ton of pens have it, but it's basically sterling silver trim with gold plating. So as opposed to just like a brass or a, you know, what are some other kind of non-precious metal, um, this is plated over sterling silver, which is pretty cool. So um, $12.79 for this pen. So it's, it's up there a little bit, but if you're a hardcore Delta fan, I think you'll enjoy it. And then it has this interesting feature to it called right balance, which is essentially you unscrew the back cap of the pen and it has you know this metal weight in the back of it and you can remove that if you want to sort of front balance the pen a little bit and i you know I'd, I'd read about it or heard about it a little bit and i was like how much of a difference does it actually make it's not like night and day like oh my gosh i can't you know like crazy because the, the weight is relatively small but um what i can say is that with the weight installed on the back it's pretty well balanced right in the middle. It's not like super back heavy with that weight on there. Um, obviously, if you try to post it, I didn't actually try posting it. Is it postable? True. Sure. You know, I didn't. I did not like it. Crystal and I were talking about that earlier today. Um, Crystal works with our QC stuff here at Goulet, Uh and it can go on, Brian, but it doesn't feel. It doesn't feel good. Yeah. It feels a little rough, and with I wouldn't. I don't with think vintage. Wanna. No, with yeah. vintage celluloid, we went ahead on our website. Mm. We're going to say it does not post just because it's a big yeah, pen anyway. Yeah, you can. Yeah, you can. You can get it on there. It doesn't look good. It doesn't feel great. And mm. I, I, I would not want to press harder to force it to post. So I'm going to yeah, say fair no. Enough. I would say don't do it. Okay. Yeah. So, so that's something. But it's a large pen. It's pretty. It's got. It's got a good amount of heft to it. It's not a super heavy pen, but it's pretty substantial. Yeah. And it's a really good size pen. Um, I found the I found the balance to be really good with the weight in the back. But if you take the weight out of the back, it does front, it feels a little more front weighted. So it's not that the weight in the back makes it feel back weighted, in my opinion, at least. It feels pretty balanced. Obviously, this will depend on your hand size and various other things. But, you know, I have a, I have a little technique that I've never like widely adopted and tried to standardize or anything. I was conceiving maybe at one point in time of trying to make a, like a standardized tool for oh, measuring yeah. the balance. I remember of that. I remember that. Yeah, but basically if you think of it like a seesaw where it's like you have a pivot point in the middle, you, there should be at some point where there's a, the pen is perfectly balanced, right? So if you take, you know, whatever, a, pen, a pencil or something like that, and you is some round object and you put the pen on it, you should be able to see like where in the middle of the pen is a thing perfectly balanced. Well, I found that it's balanced pretty much in the middle of this pen with the weight in the back. 
and you have to shift it back a little bit because it's more front weighted without that weight in the back. So maybe it makes like 10% difference, I would say at the max, but it's, it's enough where it's like, okay, I don't think it's like something where you're going to be like, oh, I want to change the feeling of the weight every week. It'll be like, oh, I either like it better with it, the weight in or not. You'll configure it once and then never think about it again. But it comes in this giant box too that's made out of wood and it's very hefty box. I will say that. It comes in an outer sleeve that is cardboard and will undoubtedly get beat up pretty good because that <laughs> heavy wood box inside the cardboard yeah, sleeve that, is going to beat it up and transit. Yeah, it. it was. it's almost like paper. It was like, it's like very card, thin, card very stock thin. almost. Yeah, but the, yeah, but the box was, inside yeah. is nice. Very it feels, nice. It feels, it's definitely, like, it feels like the kind of cardboard that... The, we're talking just about the outer sleeve. We're talking yeah. about the, the kind of cardboard that you would have in like a... Um, you know, a, 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 a gift box that you'd have for like a sweater or something like that, like yeah. an apparel box. It's that like pretty flimsy kind of cardboard. Yes. It's not yep. not the uh, corrugated cardboard at all. No, no, that that's a good but comparison. Anyway, pretty much on any pen, I'm diverting a little bit here, but on any pen that you buy, if it has an outer sleeve of any kind, consider that disposable. Like yes. I know they often brand it and all that kind of stuff, and it seems like it's part of the appeal. The reason they do those outer sleeves is so things don't get shelf worn and, you know, the box itself doesn't get, you know, damaged in transit and stuff like that. It does come up every now and then we get customers that are like, oh, my outer sleeve is banged up. And it's like, often we get it banged up. And it's like, oh, crap, what are we going to do? Yeah, like that brown and, box that comes in Twisby pens. Like that yes. thing is disposable. That is it's, that is that is a it's a bumper. Is it's what intended it is. to be sacrificial. Yes, yeah, so it is. The the, the, the acrylic with, the clear acrylic case on the inside that's meant to stay in one piece. Yeah, like that's yeah. the case. But I can understand where if you're like collecting it, you know, or if, gifting you know, it if it's a collectible or something like yeah. that. Sure, you know. But anyway, so yeah, so there's that. So go check out that pen. We'll talk more about it a little bit. I said I wasn't going to talk much about it, and then I talked about the whole thing. Dag on it. Oh well. I'll say it all again in the later segment. Um, the other pen that I have to talk about is the Twisby Eco Glow Green, which is a glow-in-the-dark, translucent green eco, which to me looks like ectoplasm. It looks like if Slimer was to have a pen, this is the pen that he would choose. So I know that warms Drew's heart and ears to hear me say those words, uh, being the Ghostbusters fan <laughs> that he is. Uh, but it really does. I mean, like, because I don't know if it's because of the translucency or whatever. I haven't actually, I forgot to look at this pen when I was in the office yesterday. I'm kicking myself. So I haven't seen it in person. Have you seen it in person yet, Drew? Yeah, or, we saw we saw it on camera this morning with with uh, our meeting. Yeah, so. but it doesn't always. Doesn't no, no, always no. Convey. But it does it does it does glow well though. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> because it's translucent, it seems like the thing is glowing even just sitting there in the room, not even in the dark. So I don't know. I'm, I'm very curious to see like how long it glows and all that kind of stuff. But anyway, there's not a lot of glow in the dark pens. It's the first Twisby glow in the dark they've ever done. So um, if you're into that eco, it's super affordable. I love that pen anyways. Easy recommend. So go check that out. I think we'll have already launched it maybe by the time this video publishes or I think probably, or probably the day this publishes, I believe we will have launched okay. it. Yeah. So by the time everybody sees this, it'll, it'll be launched. Mm -hmm. So yeah, go check that one out. It's 30, what, 2 or something like that. Anyway, so... All right, Drew, what you got? Um, already available, we have a new SD from Estherbrook. So this is their you know, self-titled model, for lack of a better term. And it has that beautiful cushion cap that has a great airtight seal to it. It's a really, really fun pen. And they've done a lot of recent limited editions. This one is technically a seasonal edition. Um, I haven't actually said the name of this. It's called the Maui. <laughs> so it's a really, really interesting acrylic with a ton of different colors all compressed into it. I don't think we've had an SD thus far that has been this vibrant. It's got a lot going on with it. And uh, so it is uh, meant to be a seasonal edition. I, it's not specifically limited. It's definitely not going to be around forever, but it's not like there's only going to be 20. So it... You still should probably get it while you can because it will be a seasonal edition. But um, honestly, I don't even know what season this is. Is this a fall edition, Brian, or is this a summer thing? I don't know what season it is, but it's semi quasi special limited seasonal. I think edition. they're gonna have. I think they're gonna have it through the end of the year. So it's there like, you go. So it's a big season. I would consider it more like a special edition. I think that's how they're intending it. It's not like that. It's made for a you know. Yeah, I just don't specified. Know. Have, it's season. listed. It's officially a seasonal edition, so I just don't really know what that means. But anyway, yeah, it's think, available um, now. You can get it. It looks nice and it functions very very nicely as well. Um, and then additionally, coming in uh, early September, who we hope is going to be a uh, quad quint not quintet quad 
What do you call a group of four, Brian? Uh, uh, quartet. 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 Yeah. A quartet of new Robert Foster. I was, Foster I was about to say a quadret. I was. Like, I know. Oh, for some reason, my brain was just not working on there. <laughs> So a new quartet of Robert Oster inks, and these are all going to be Australis inks. So there is a theme. There is Australis Oak, Australis Rose, Australis Hydra, and Australis Tea. And they all look very nice. The real nice one, though, is Oak. It is a nice, natural, brownish, orangey situation. I think it's going to have some pretty solid shading. So I'm most eager to try that one, Brian. So... Either way, excited to have some new Robert Oster inks back in the mix. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So you can check out the coming soon section or new arrivals on GoodlyPens.com for a lot more details about all these pens and lots of other things that are going to be coming out. All right. Let's get into it with Q and A. Hey. <laughs> All right, our first question this week is this week's our first question this week, Brian, is from our old friend Chantal, who has Ooh, been hello. a commenter from the early days. So thank mm -hmm. you for that. Chantal asks, how clean is clean enough? Mm. I clean my fountain pens and I think they're clean, but when I touch a paper towel to the base where the nib and feed meet the grip, a lot of ink still comes out onto the paper towel. Does mm. it even matter? Ooh, that's a great question. It's mm. a great question. I'm tempted to say it depends because it does. But you're, but you're not going to because but you don't hate me. I kind of just said it though. Um, I would say, <laughs> so my my feelings around this is that clean enough is is the standard, right? So you only need to clean your pen enough to do whatever the next thing is that you're doing with it. You What, what, what did you just say? I just said it depends in a more confusing way. <laughs> Uh, what, did, what what even was I'll, that? I will contextualize. Okay. I have further I have further bullet points to address Drew. Okay. Um so if you've flushed the pens several times, it's probably fine with most inks. Um I haven't had my own issues or heard of any catastrophic issues with somebody that's flushed their pens several times, had a little bit of ink kind of left in mixed with the water that's left that's you know pretty diluted like you're what you're describing, Chantal and then had something just majorly wrong, like some crazy thing happen. Maybe, I mean, your mileage will vary depending on which ink you're using, and there's certainly inks with more extreme properties. Yeah, you generally want to clean those out more thoroughly, especially if you're changing inks to something else. But I would say if you, um, if you're, you know, if you're just doing regular normal maintenance, especially if you're re-inking it with the same ink, you don't have to get everything out of there. You're getting 99% of it out by the time you've flushed it, you know, repeatedly for a minute or two. You know, if you're using something pigmented or shimmery or something like that, maybe you go a little bit further. Or if it's like completely dried out and crusty, like most of my pens get before I clean them, Ugh. it might take a little more work, but it depends what your end goal is, right? So I would say, the safest bet is to clean it until all the water is perfectly clear, until you can't see anything else in there, right? That's just across the board. That's going to be the safest bet because there's nothing left. So yes, that would be the blanket statement of thing to do. But with just regular maintenance using the same ink, if you still have some colored water, especially like right up there, because what happens most of the time is you clean out the majority of the bulk of the pen. But usually what happens with what you're describing, Chantal, is you get a little bit of ink that's kind of caught around where like the feed is kind of mating up on the inside of the grip. And there's like a little spot there that just isn't getting the bulk of the flushing as you're cleaning it in and out. But over time, it'll kind of work its way through once it's resaturated and you're inking with it and stuff like that. So yes, to a degree, there will be a little bit of ink left over that will mix with whatever the next thing you're using. But if you're inking it up with the same ink again, it does not matter. You'll be fine. You're trying to get the bulk of the, f the feed, you know, flushed out and all that kind of stuff. And that's happening just with your regular flushing. If you're using a known troublesome ink, like something pigmented or like a Noodler's Bay State or something like that, or a shimmer and you're trying to go to a non-shimmer or using like a black or a dark brown and you're trying to go to a yellow, okay, then you may wanna go a little bit further and just make sure you get everything out of there. That way you don't get some like mixing that can happen again. But again, most of the issues I've heard with people that mix their inks in the pens has been, they either don't clean it out at all or you know they forget which ink that they have 
<laughs> used last time and they go to re-ink it with something else and they just put some completely other ink into a pen that has not even been flushed. That's, and even then you usually get like some weird color, but it's not like the stuff like bubbles up and explodes and destroys your pen. That's so incredibly rare that I wouldn't really lose any sleep over it. Again, caveat being, unless you're using a known ink that has some extreme properties. Um, so if you're changing colors, knowingly changing colors, it's best to get as much of the old ink out of there as possible. Um, and you want that water to be clear. And, and if what you're doing is you're, you're flushing the pen and then you're, you know, using a paper towel, you know, which is what I like to do and kind of like wrapping it around the nib after you do it, that'll, that'll wick away a lot of water and stuff that's left in the feed. Cause even after you flush the pen out, there's still gonna be water left in that feed. If you take and you wrap that feed and the nib with your paper towel, any color that's left in there is gonna absorb in the paper towel and you'll be able to see if it's clear water or if it has a little bit of ink left in there. But honestly, if there's even the slightest bit of ink mixed in with that water, it'll show up on the paper towel. So it's not like if there's any ink on here, it's this huge volume of ink. You've already flushed it. You've gotten most of that out of there. You're probably seeing just the tiniest, tiniest little diluted fraction of ink that's left. I wouldn't necessarily lose a lot of sleep over it, but if you if it bothers you, just keep flushing the pen or fill the pen with water, let it sit for an hour or two or whatever and come back to it. Give that water time to work its way all around the feed and stuff and do it or use a bulb syringe or you can do it. There's lots of different techniques that you can use. Um, if you have a pen where the feed and the nib are easily removable or like you can remove those out of the housing, do that and then you can rinse the feed. You can use a toothbrush, whatever. That's really great with shimmering ink. I know, we need a Drew Lay toothbrush. I was waiting for it. I was waiting now, for it. You knew it was going to come up. I was um, hoping. So I would say, particularly if you have pigmented or shimmer ink, then you actually have a physical particulate in the ink. Those like to hang around in all the fins and parts of the feed. So it's, it's most efficient if you have a pen where you can remove the feed, especially in the nib. Cleaning that with a toothbrush, is, it saves a lot of time. Um, you know, you can use a pen flush that sometimes helps, but the pigmented, you know, stuff really a physical scrubbing of it is by far the most effective because you're cleaning a physical particulate out of there. Um, so that's something that might be helpful to you. Um, and then the only, the only other times where I am really going to some pretty hardcore lengths to clean a pen is if I know it's a pen that I'm not going to be using for a while and I want to store it away. <laughs> So I would say all of these pens, you know, you want to clean to a degree and it's okay if there's a little bit of water left in there or whatever, you ink it back up, it all kind of mixes and gets diluted and that's fine. Um, it's not that much water that's left in there anyway. Um, but if you're going to be storing the pen for a long time, some of these pens like the cap seals really well. And if you're leaving a little bit of water in there, you're going to be leaving it in there for maybe quite some time. And if you have hard water that you're cleaning it in, all that, you can get some scale that builds up on there. So I would try to get the pen as clean as possible um, before storing it away, like capping it and storing it away. So if I'm cleaning out my pens, I know it's one I'm not going to use for a while. I will clean it, dry it as well as I can with the nib, you know, paper towel deal. And then I'll actually leave it sitting out, uh, maybe overnight. Let it all like air dry before I cap it and store it away for months, maybe years. Um, and the last thing I have around all this is if you're using a cleaner, like a pen flush or maybe a dish soap or some, some additional cleaner beyond just water, make sure that you're flushing with water as your final step. You don't want any of that cleaner left over in there, whether you're storing it or inking it up with another color, you want to make sure that water is the last thing that you use out of it. And, uh, so basically, I mean, you can go to more extreme lengths, like you can use an ultrasonic cleaner and stuff like that, which you really only need if you're like restoring a pen or if it's like super dried, crusty, nasty. But I, that's not really what you addressed here, so I won't get deep into that. But my my whole thing with all this is you really only need to clean it as much as you feel you need to for the next purpose that that pen will serve. Got okay. Anything, got anything to add? Uh, no, no, I don't. Okay. I think you covered it. I did cover it, didn't I? Not a deep dive, but, a, you know, we went we went into the adult end of the pool, I guess. Swimming deeper end. You can't touch, you know. I don't know what I'm talking about. Uh, how about I move on to the next question, though, from Emily. Uh, Emily says, I've often heard the term well-behaved used when describing inks. What does that mean? Well, hello, Emily. Thank you for asking. I think that's a great question because we do say that quite a bit and uh, haven't defined it. A lot of people And yeah. for me, I can tell you what it means for me personally, and that might differ from other people like mm. that guy. Um, 
So when I use the term well-behaved, I usually think of flow and maintenance. So to me, well-behaved means uh, both low maintenance and reliable. Mm -hmm. So as far as flow goes, an ink with uh, saturation, um, with a ton of complex dyes or pigment or shimmer, everything that's added to an ink is basically like adding a variable to its behavior, right? Um, the more complex an ink, the more potentially complex the behavior. Not, It's not a given. There are certainly inks with a ton of ingredients that flow just fine without any complications at all. But each mm. one still is a variable and you don't know how they're going to react together and that can cause you know, unpredictable flow stuff. So um, the inks that tend to have features to them like shimmer, like you know, uh, pigmentation or some sort of permanence, any other sort of feature. That, that's, that's something that goes into the ink physically that makes it do that thing, that feature. So every one of those is a variable. Usually a non, you know, a non-issue variable, but a variable nonetheless. Hmm. Um, and uh, so ink with fewer variables may not necessarily flow um, better 100% of the time. That's certainly not the case. Mm -hmm. But it will probably be, its behavior on in your uh, pen on the page will probably be more consistent throughout a bunch of different uh, feed types or paper mm. types, just you know, kind of yeah. one of those middle of the road inks. But that said, a lot of them might not be you know super amazing or fun. So mm. you kind of it's it's a bit of a give or take. Um, and maintenance is kind of like the same uh, same basic principles, uh, but toward upkeep and cleaning. So like Brian said with his previous question, uh, shimmer inks are obviously way harder to clean. That's just a fact. They've got chunks in them that settle. They all they don't they don't stay in suspension. That'd be amazing if someone did create a shimmer ink where the shimmer just stayed in perfect suspension like an old Orbeez bottle, but that does not happen unfortunately. Um, not orbits, not Orbeez, orbits that drink. Orbeez are something different, right? Yeah, Orbeez are those little um, polycarbonate like a, balls. Yeah, like absorb water or whatever. Yeah, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about Orbeez, the beverage, which stayed in magical, beautiful suspension. Which, Someone could fi figure that, was that around, out. That was around for like one year in the mid '90s or something, right? And yet, its legend remains. Does it though? Sure. Does people, anybody know what we're talking about? I definitely think people know what they're talking about. I mean, Orbeez, come on. It's. I mean, I, I know what you're talking about. Yeah. But. I was, too busy, cool. I was too busy drinking Surge at the time. Ooh, and Fruitopia. Mm, there you go. <laughs> anyway. And, and Fresca. Um, yep. Uh, so um, the behavior, if we're talking about well-behaved inks, with Shimmer inks is that it's going to behave a little bit more unpredictably. It's going to have features, but its predictability in terms of flow is going to vary because at first when you ink up a Shimmer pen, uh, and shimmer ink in a pen, all of those particles are going to be a little bit more well distributed than after you pick up an ink that's been inked up with shimmer ink for a few days. Because at that point, a lot of the shimmer is going to have settled. And even if you agitate it a little bit, it very well may not still be distributed well enough to prevent clogging. So again, behavior. I, I won't call them badly behaved inks. They just behave with a higher degree of... Uh, consideration factors, I suppose. So, um, I, you know, and then there's also um, some uh, permanent inks uh, resulting in staining. So those need to have additional considerations made in terms of cleaning. So you got to work a little bit harder to get some of those out so you don't have a pink tinged converter, uh, which Brian mentioned a couple episodes ago when we were talking about pink inks, how they kind of have a, for whatever reason, a higher likelihood of um, staining clear parts of the pens. Mm -hmm. So, um, and then of course you've got your uh, reddish, browny, orangish inks that are a little bit more prone to creating ink crustaceans on top of your nib. And again, not bad behavior, just behavior that uh, requires a little bit more attention sometimes. So when I personally talk about well-behaved inks, I'm just talking about inks that don't have any of those considerations, none of those bonus considerations that you have to take into account just in order to use the ink. Well-behaved ink, in my opinion, is just, you know, regular ink that you don't have to make any special considerations for in terms of just having it behave well in the pen and behave well on the paper. And I also include um, feathering and bleed through and all that, an ink that uh, doesn't, again, just a lack of considerations. You don't have to worry about anything else other than it going on the page and 
flowing through your pen. That's well behaved from my perspective. Brian, do you have a different perspective on that? This is a, it surprisingly got me thinking about more things about what well behaved means than when I initially read the question, as you've been told. Well, that's not, that's not surprising. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I, I haven't, I haven't been ignoring you. I've been writing down some like questions that I oh, God. have been thinking about and I'm trying not to be rude. <laughs> um, not in this moment, at least. <laughs> I definitely try to be rude other times. Um, I was trying to think like, is, is behavior of an ink? I mean, is it something standalone to the ink itself or is it only in relation to the pen? You know, cause I think about like behavior could be interpreted as is it feathering? Is it bleeding? Is it, is the dry time really long? You know, it's like, certainly yeah. I think some people interpret that as how is it, how is the ink once it's down on the paper, like it's out of the pen, but I can certainly see it also encompassing how it flows through the pen. Does yeah. It, I, I, does, I consider it dry all that. out in the pen, yeah. but then it's like, there are so many factors there that may not necessarily be related to the ink. Even it could be, you could be the type of paper you're using the type of certainly, pen. certainly, but, so a, like, but a truly well-behaved ink, in my opinion, works well on a, on a wide variety of all of that, a wide variety of okay. pens and a wide variety of paper types. Okay. Something, so something that's to, something that's very versatile and that I don't need to worry so about. Again, so it's, it's all about it's those something considerations. That's more, it's more like, Relative, I guess, and kind of all yeah. Like I don't have to. It's going to be fine on Tomoe, and it's going to be fine on Lloydstrom. You know, it's going to okay. be fine in this, you know, cheapo Jinhao, and it's going to be fine in my Namiki, which I don't actually own. So just a lack of considerations. You know, something you just don't really need to worry about it. Because I, but I do enjoy a lot of inks that I do need to worry about, and that's okay. One of those in my one of one of my three pens is fine, but I'm not going to put any. I don't want to have three inks in my three mm. pens that I have to make considerations for. Fair enough. So my other question is like, is the determination of something, the behavior of a given ink, would you, and again, we're just pontificating here. Yeah, yeah, this is just my opinion. Is it taking like all ink behavior into account and putting it relative on that scale? Or is it like grouped into given categories? I'm thinking specifically like a heavy shimmer or heavy sheen ink. You know, it's like, would all shimmer and all sheen inks be considered not well behaved just because those properties, you know, put it more That's on a the good fringes? question. That's a good question. And I will use my coffee analogy for that because hmm. um, you can't really compare coffee from a bar at 11 p.m. when all your friends are drinking and you don't really have anything to do. So you order coffee. That coffee is not going to be great, Brian. I've been there many times. It's not going to be great. But you know what? It's there. It's what you got. It's not going to be Starbucks at 10 a.m. You know, so mm. if you're if, so, yes, if you wanted to compare it to that, all shimmer inks are going to be poorly behaved inks. But that's not fair, right? That's just not fair. You can't compare the shimmer inks to, you know, a plain old ink in terms of performance because they are different. They are the 11 p.m. bar coffee. All right. You need to compare it to other 11 p.m. bar coffees or a crappy coffee from 7-Eleven, you know, uh, late at night which is also going to be terrible first-hand experience. Um, so you would just, I would compare that with shimmer inks to shimmer inks. So, I mean, certainly you can compare it to everything if you wanted to, but if I were to say, I maintain that the 1670 mm. inks are the most well-behaved shimmer inks. I, I would say that's a fact. I think that- Sure, sure. Well, that, you're, like, the, you're like narrowing the Absolutely, the exactly. Pool. So the, yeah. to, to your point, you can absolutely categorize. But I would say that in terms of um, hmm. behavior, I would say 1670 inks are not well-behaved compared to- Compared know, to I, like I, in, in the scheme of all yeah. fountain pen ink. Right, exactly. Anything with shimmer, anything pigmented, anything exactly. with a heavy sheen yeah. is going to be further on the scale of- not being well behaved just because right. it it requires more it re, you yeah. know a compromise that many people are willing to make but i right. see i think I, i'm trying to just i'm trying to decide in my own mind where i fall in terms of like how absolute and how relative and sounds like you need some arbitrary rules brian oh i think i do i think i do uh -huh. i do but i think i okay so i'm trying to i'm trying to think, think about <laughs> it in my head it's like a little cloudy but i mean I think to me, the term well-behaved means different things to different people. That's why basically everybody you ever see review ink, they'll talk, they'll throw the term around well-behaved or whatever, low maintenance or whatever, all these things. What does any of this mean, right? It's all relative. It's all uh. subjective. I think that, you know, it, I agree completely with what you're saying, Drew, where any 
any ink that is generally kind of all around good in lots of different pens, lots of different papers, lots of different combos that kind of like, if you've got, you know, like a target and you're going to hit kind of the center of the target for just pleasure and ease of use, cleaning, all that, all that stuff, that's your well-behaved stuff. Anything outside of that doesn't mean that's not a good ink or whatever. Right. It just means that you're going to be compromising. You need to do additional stuff. You need to take it into consideration. You exactly. know, if you're using like, an iron gall ink as an example. For sure. You know, it's not a well-behaved ink generally by our classification, I guess, in this case. If the, if, if you're the using middle it for of the bullseye, purpose. if the bullseye is <clears throat> Urban ink, then yes. Yeah. Uh, or iron gall ink will lay outside of that bullseye. Yeah. That doesn't mean it's bad, but it's not right. the bullseye of well-behaved. Yeah, but I think that I think that it could be interpreted where well-behaved means it's not a good ink, and I don't think that's necessarily fair. So I think it has to be contextualized, and I think that's where this this term gets thrown around. But it always has to be put in context of like what kind of ink is this and what purpose is it serving. So yeah, I think to, for to, me, for me, as long as you can sort of classify, you know, what purpose is that ink doing, then you can say whether it's well-behaved or not. And generally, it's like, does it take a lot of extra work to use or clean or whatever with this ink? So what you're trying to say is. It depends. <laughs> One could interpret it as that, but you put those words in my mouth. I didn't say uh -huh. I didn't need to, though, did I? Yeah, no, you didn't. <laughs> All anyway, right. Good, Do you want good to go to the next question. one? Yeah. And okay. for reference, I spent the better part of 13 years trying to come up with some standardized terms for reviewing pens and ink and all that. And it's just like the most frustrating thing because everybody uses different terms and all this. And it's like, it is all so subjective. Mm -hmm. It's very, very difficult to put truly objective things to it. There are like some scientific things you can measure and say, yeah, just like, you know, if you're, if you're reviewing wine, you can say like, how acidic is it? Or how, what type of grape was used or whatever. But when you're talking about like reviewing, like what's a good wine, like what's a good wine to pair with, with steak, 100% subjective. Like you just, there's like general rules that people come up with. That's, we have a less sophisticated version of that going on in the fountain pen world when it comes to well-behaved inks. It's just the general consensus of the community with a lot of different inks, a lot of different pens being used. You just kind of look at who does it, but there's no like point scale, you know, like there is for wine uh, around ink. So maybe we should come up with one. No, that's terrible. I'm not going to do that. No. You are not standardized God. enough to do that, but... <laughs> That's what would yeah, benefit. That's what would like benefit. These just, they just break your brain. I'm a, I'm a, like, a, I'm a, I'm a brainstormer. Like I'm a thought broadener, you know. So when oh I'm left, God. when I'm given something kind of ambiguous like this, All I'm right, not like well, a narrow down and make it concise. I'm like a think broader and come up with grander right. ideas. Well, this was, this was my question to keep concise. This next one though Whoops. is yours. You can run with this one. You can be as crazy okay. as you want with this one. So, okay. Our, our friend Caitlin who uh, I'm actually excited to see in at the San Francisco Pen Show this weekend. Hey. Um, our friend Caitlin asks, why are fountain pens called fountain pens? Does the name in any other language translate dot, 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 ellipses? Great, uh, great let, question. Let's find out. Let's find out. I'm curious. Tell me, Brian. Yeah. Well, to be clear, I don't, I'm not fluent in any other language besides English. I'm barely fluent in English. So um, we, you know, are not the authoritative people on this, but um, I'll give you a little bit about how fountain pens came to be called fountain pens, which I've talked about before previously, but in case you missed it, I'll, I'll give a brief recap and then I'll talk about the, the foreign languages thing. Um, so before fountain pens came about in like the mid to late 1800s, right? That's when a lot of the technology started to come about. You see a lot of patents around it. Um, you basically had to dip a quill or maybe a metal nib that was on, you know, just a, a nib holder, just a stick. There was no ink reservoir. You maybe could hold a little bit of ink kind of on the tip, but basically every line or two, you were having to dip your pen over and over again. Pretty cumbersome, technically portable, but not, not super convenient. So the real revelation of the time was being able to put ink in the writing device and take it with you so you didn't have to carry around a bottle of ink and you didn't have to continually dip, you know, cause like you would have to dip and then it would start to dry up and you'd have to dip again and maybe sort of go over the last letters that you wrote and try and make it look continuous. The major revelation was that just you'd ink up your pen, it was portable and you could just write and 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 write until it ran out of ink, which is like a long time from then, right? So 
The technology, especially developed at the turn of the 20th century, really improved the reliability of the ink reservoirs in pens that were made for mass production. There were all kinds of like prototypes and other things like that previously, but really it was patenting the technology and being able to mass produce reliable enough pens. You know, it's not that they maybe didn't exist prior to that, but that's really when kind of with the industrial revolution, that's really when the mass production of pens got to the point where you know, if you look, if you, um, there's something, uh, a book called Crossing the Chasm that has a bell curve of like your early adopters. And then you've got like your middle of your bell, which are like your, oh, I forget the exact terminology, but it's like the the majority. And then you've got your laggards whenever it, so there's like any type of technology. So you had early adopters at that time, but like really once fountain pens kind of hit that majority, that was around kind of the turn of the 20th century. And that was when you had pens that were reliable enough where they wouldn't, necessarily like blurt ink all over your clothes when you carried it with you. You know, it would write continuously without burping all over the page. It still happened, but it was reliable enough to where people felt confident in carrying them around. That's when fountain pens became mainstream. So you still had typewriters, you still had dip pens and stuff like that, but fountain pens were the smartphone of the day in the early 20th century. So um, that's really, that's really what changed the game. And the reason that they were called fountain pens Aha. is because they viewed the flow of ink like a reservoir, like a fountain has a reservoir of water and ink flows out of the reservoir through the fountain in a continuous stream. So everything that I found in terms of like the language around it, um, even in other foreign languages has generally some description of fountain or reservoir or something like that related to it because it was this this notion of there's like a source uh, like a a, a, a a hidden like source of this ink water or whatever that you like tap into and then it flows continuously so that, that was makes what, so much sense mm -hmm. yeah i never thought when i hear the term fountain like a lot of people probably i only think of the ejection of the water the actual spritz, the flow. I never think about the reservoir. Yeah, I mean, think but of it as like the equivalent of, I mean, this is maybe not the right point in time of technology or whatever, but it's like the equivalent of you having to like walk to a stream or, or like go to a well and like get a bucket and like haul it up and then you have some water and you can take a drink versus you have like a well pump or, or a water fountain and you just like push a button or pump it and you can just pump and pump and pump and pump and, pump and it just flows. It just flows mm -hmm. continuously. That's kind of like what it's, I mean, it's, that's a terrible analogy. I'm never gonna use that one. No, again, no, no, but whatever. <laughs> but um, it is it is intriguing that <laughs> that uh, it's the yeah. reservoir of the fountain that is yeah, just, that was, ju that just as was, key as the flow. That was the game changer at the time. Ah. You had, cause you had metal nibs that came out first. So that was like the first big piece of technology. Once you didn't have to use like natural feather quills or like bamboo shoots or things like that. Once you didn't have to use these like, I mean, literally you'd have to like walk around and find feathers or like pluck them off a bird and then cut it. And do, you know, you had to like, I mean, literally that's what people were doing to be able to write. They were like plucking feathers off birds cutting them and all this and they'd write with them they would break down so you'd have to keep a, a good source of feathers going it was kind of ridiculous and then they came out with metal nibs that was like ugh, early to mid 1800s i think those came first so even that was a revelation just like you have like modern calligraphy you know dip nibs they're like spring steel and they're you know more or less disposable that's what they had first. So that even that was a step in the right direction. That was a bit its own sort of revelation, not to have to walk around and pluck feathers off birds all the time, to be able to have metal that was you know uh, reliable enough manufactured to be able to write with it. But then really, it's that once you had the reservoir of ink inside the pen, that was a game changer. And they there was nib technology that had to come around with that. There was feed. It was the, really the feed technology was a major game changer. You had tons of filling mechanisms that were being designed that could hold the ink, not leak, you know, be able to fill into the pen. You know, basically a fountain pen is a controlled leak. That's, that's all it is, you know? So you're trying to have it be where you have a proper air ink interchange inside the pen. They had to figure all this stuff out. We know all this now because we have patents and history and all this, but they literally were having to figure all this out. You know, so it's like, how do you get the ink to stay in a pen, be able to be carried around and ride on your friggin' horse and bounce around everywhere and not have it leak all over you but then when you need to write with it, you can just uncap it and it just flows out in the proper amount. That was like 
they spent a lot of time, a lot of money, a lot of energy around figuring out that technology. And there's all these patents and technology and stuff around that with various companies like AT Cross and Parker and Schaefer and Waterman and all these companies that are still known today for fountain pens. These are the ones that were, that were patenting these things around this time. It was this explosion of technology that enabled this. So that's where it all came from, was that notion of the reservoir in the pen. So that I already knew mostly. So um, what was new for me with this question was the other languages part. Um, you know, because we've like, we sell fountain pens obviously with, you know, from other countries and there's lots of fountain pen companies obviously that are, you know, just as old as Waterman and Cross and all these other ones. Um, I think a lot of the patents and stuff came out from, you know, primarily English speaking companies, you know, UK and, and American based ones. Um, but, you know, to give credit where credit's due, this technology was happening all over the world. It was just the right point in time that was happening. Um, I think the, you know, with the industrial revolution, there were a lot of American brands that really just uh, went mass market and went global with it um, and were more known for that at the time. But it um, seems to be that English is, you know, where most of the terms originated around fountain pen kind of specifically. Um, but it was helpful. I had to Google this a little bit. And again, it's like, take the source for what it is. Um, but I did find a really helpful uh, fountain pen network thread um, where they talked about what is a fountain pen in other languages. And um, basically, without getting deep into it, and I don't speak these languages, so I can't really verify it so easily. I did like type them into like Google Translate and I could see like, oh, okay, that word translates to that in Dutch or Italian or whatever. But I don't know like the culture behind what these words mean. So they explain that some of that in the thread and we can link to it in the, in the YouTube description. Um, but basically all the other languages seem to have some variant of pen, feather, stick, writing, fountain, fill, reservoir, or some other meaning around that. So most of the other languages, it's like fountain pen, or it might be like ink stick writing or feather, you know, feather reservoir writing or some, some variation of like all these words put together in, in whatever their language is that means basically the same thing, fountain pen. Um, but it's, it's all kind of around that idea. So if you want to check out that thread, that's cool. I have no affiliation with anybody that wrote it or whatever. Um, but they post it in like English, Spanish, French, Portuguese, Italian, German, Dutch, um, Indonesian, Danish, and Swedish. So they don't have Japanese, they don't have any other ones, but you know, that's, uh, that's what they posted. And there's some other people that commented and stuff like that, but I don't know. So that was kind of interesting. And if any of y'all want to comment in, in YouTube, um, let us know what other languages and maybe there's cultural context that we don't understand. But from, from what I understand, most of the other languages have a similar, you know, kind of understanding of, uh, or similar, I don't know, verbiage around. You didn't, uh, you don't have any of these other fountain pen names? Uh, I, can, I can, yeah, I'll say some, but I'm going to botch them. I mean, I'd like to hear at least one. <sighs> I can't, I can't really do a, a proper ac accents and stuff like that. Um, Spanish. I'm, that's why I want to hear. Uh, gosh. <clears throat> Gotta like get in the zone. Okay. Pluma estilográfica or pluma fuente. Okay. So that feather, feather I mean, is pluma in Latin. Um, estilo is style from the Latin word stylus or a stake or a pointed instrument or from the Greek word stulos, a pillar or column. Graphica is graph from the Greek word graphe, a writing or signature and fuente is fountain or source. So that's Spanish. Um, anyway, French is stylo plume or stylo a plume. And that's, you know, there's a lot of is, similar lives. To, is, to, is German just Fuller? Uh, German, they have Fuller or Fuhlfederhalter. Oh, okay. So like fill, it's like fill nib holder. Okay. Halt, halter, yeah. Interesting. That's very short. Normally, uh, yeah, you Dutch, know, Dutch is Vulpen, which is fill. Pen, oh. like a, a pen you can fill. That sounds awesome. Vulpen. Vulpen. That sounds like oh. a super villain. Man, Vulpen. that sounds cool. Yes. I want to. Right? Man, I want a Vulpen. Yeah. So there's all kinds of cool stuff around there. So yeah, it's very interesting. But it, it seems like at least from what I can read up about, you know, some of this that everybody's kind of on the same track. You know, it's all kind of pointing to the same stuff. It's like a stick with ink in it that you write with started out with feather. Maybe it's got some feather in there. But yeah, that's basically what's going on. So yeah, kind of interesting. Cool. That was interesting. Right? I thought that was cool. I don't think I'd ever been asked like, 
how much the fountain language translates to other languages. That's kind of neat. But I know we have a big international YouTube audience, so y'all probably have a lot more context than we do. So please, please let me know how badly I brought these pronunciations or um, if there's additional cultural context behind some of the words in what is called fountain pen in your language that uh, would be cool for us to know. So yeah. yeah, that was a good question. And, 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 and I knew that Caitlin also had a question getting answered by CY next week, but I'm like, this is a good question. So I included mm -hmm. it. So I will say too, Drew, the... Drew, you're going to San Francisco. I am soon. That's got a pretty big international, um, especially like uh, Southeast Asian, uh, you know, uh, being on the other side of the country than where we are. There's much more like international on that side. We have a lot that come from Europe for the DC pen show, but there's a lot more that come from uh, Asia uh, that go to the San Francisco pen show. So that should be kind of cool to see different folks there. Well, good. We All didn't right. try to we didn't try to botch any of their languages, so that's good. Oh yeah, yeah, was, uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean. <laughs> Their written languages and spoken languages are very different and all that. I don't even know For sure. how you would type that out in like something like a forum. But anyway. Poorly. Yeah, poorly. Exactly. <laughs> Especially if you don't know the language at all. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, I got a question for you, Drew. All right. From Lincoln Punch. I don't know if he's going around punching cars or <laughs> statues of Abraham Lincoln. No, I don't know. His name's probably Lincoln. Anyway, do nibs get smoother as you use them, can a scratchy steel nib become smooth over time? Uh, well, Mr. Punch, uh, the short answer is yes, but it'll take a super, 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 super long time. Because like, if you tried to take a little piece of paper and just like rub it on a nib for a long time, like it's gonna it's take you a long, long time to sand that thing down it's it's mildly abrasive the paper. mildly now if it was if it was just steel like an untipped steel nib that's gonna wear down a lot sooner than a tipped nib most if it's the only time it'll be untipped usually is if it's a stub nib uh a steel stub nib gold nib gold stubs are usually tipped and that tipping is super hard that's why they use it and there's it's a very very hard alloy so uh it takes decades um or just 24 seven writing over a couple years potentially. But uh, either way, yes, it's possible. It's unlikely. What's more likely to happen is if, um, so the reason most nibs are scratchy is because they're misaligned. Like the time, one time is higher than the other, one time is lower than the other. So um, for that to get potentially corrected through writing, A, it's more likely you will lose or break the pen before you'll ever actually wear down the nib. Uh, and B or two, whatever I said earlier, um, <laughs> if you do happen to kind of correct your nib, uh, make it not scratchy just through the use of writing, what's more likely is that you accidentally realigned your tines. Um, and that can happen. I, I've seen some people actually in an attempt to align their tines, they'll actually kind of just press one side to paper at an angle, thereby flexing one down or up. I don't recommend that because uh, I just don't like it. Um, it, can, it can work, but it's It it's can, not can a, work. It's not my recommended tactic. It's not as, tactic, it's not but, as controlled a way to do it, yeah. Right, but it can be done, and, we, and we've seen it done. So uh, if that happens and you're all of a sudden like, oh my gosh, it works now, maybe that happened without you knowing it. So that's definitely possible. Um, and it's kind of like uh, if you are um, uh, writing at an angle and you're kind of favoring one side of the rotation over another, it is possible that if you own a fountain pen over decades, that one side will get worn down more than the other. It's kind of like shoes. If you walk with a little bit of a tilt, then you know one part of your right shoe will get worn down faster than one part of your left shoe over time. But of course, that we're talking about pavement and rubber or some sort of synthetic sole versus a you know iridium alloy or something like that on paper. So very very different, mm. much much greater time spans we're talking about, but. It's same, same in principle. It can happen. Same thing with like tires. If your car is misaligned, you know, your, you know, driver's side left is going to wear out faster than the right if you don't have a good alignment. But, you know, we could go with analogies all day. Um, if your nib is scratchy, uh, I would say don't count on just riding with it to get it better. Um, either look up some videos on how to align your tines or visit a professional nib grinder at a pen show or send a pen to them for that correction. So, uh, just writing with a pen isn't a reliable way to get it to be not scratchy. So that is, I will say that with confidence. 
Um, if uh, now the flip side, how I did say you could accidentally align your nib by writing with it at a certain angle, you can also do the opposite. Your nib could start off just fine and become misaligned. Mm. And I've done that a few times, always with my ultra extra fine nibs, because if those are even slightly misaligned, you feel it and feel it big um, because they're just such a tiny, tiny point on those things. So I have to realign my extra, extra fine nibs more so than I ever have to realign any of the other size nibs that I have. And uh, that can definitely happen over time if you write with a certain degree of rotation. So with my extra fines and ultra extra fines, I try to be really, really careful about my hand positioning because I don't want that to happen because honestly, it's kind of a pain in the butt to align tiny, tiny nibs. I'm pretty okay at it. But when you get into those ultra extra fine territory, it can be really difficult. And I've actually had to get professionals to do it. So um, just be cognizant of your rotation so that doesn't happen um, and you won't have to uh, deal with that. But the short answer is that yes, it can happen, but it takes a really, really long time. Mm. And don't count on that repairing a scratchy nib if you have one. Either adjust it yourself or get it sent to a pro. Yeah, it's kind of like if you are living in a environment with multiple people, the natural state will be for things to degrade over time, not naturally like clean themselves up and get better. <laughs> I think it's the same with nibs. Nibs naturally will not just generally like get better. You might get more familiar with it. You might adjust it. You might, you know, get more accustomed to it or whatever, but rarely is it just gonna like magically fix everything. Um, so I, I agree with you on that one, Drew. I will say one thing that popped in my mind that happened. So yes, often it's misalignment. Sometimes what can happen um, is, you know, in the nib process, when they're making a nib, you know, they stamp out the nib, they cut the slit for the tines. There's a step there. The alignment is important, but the step that you do after you cut and align it, you want to, I mean, generally you're aligning it several times throughout the process, but especially towards the end. But if you think about when it's cutting, it's a very thin, very thin wheel that's using to cut that slit. Well, it's cutting into it, but when it does that, it's leaving a pretty sheer edge on the inside of the slit right at the tip. And that's, especially like on the cross stroke as you're writing, that little part at the bottom right there, that's what's gonna catch the paper and it doesn't take much. You're, we're talking almost like microns here. So what every nibmeister that I knew will do as part of their process when smoothing a nib, they'll very slightly, you know, push down one tine and just take a very fine abrasive and just like barely just like boop, just like rub the very inside of, you know, so if you got the ball, if you're looking straight at the nib, you got the ball and the slits right here, they'll just like knock this little bit of an edge with like a micro mesh or some like super fine abrasive on one of those uh, like nail files, you know, the like cushy nail file with the abrasive kind of thing. They'll just knock that, that just very inside thing. If you do it too much, that's where you get baby's bottom, right? And you get capillary issues. But if you knock it off just a little bit, that makes it so that you don't have a sharp edge that's catching. So sometimes if it looks aligned, and again, your mileage may vary, do this at your own risk, but if you have some sort of abrasive like that and you wanna try just barely like nicking that inside where the, the bottom of the tip like kind of meets each other where it touches the paper, that can often be like a total game changer in terms of uh, how smooth it feels. So you don't necessarily have to do like all this grinding and all this kind of crazy stuff. Sometimes just that little bit, especially if it like just barely feels like it's catching and it's especially if it's like in one direction, maybe not the other, that literally might be all you need. So it's just that little bit, it's a little step. Every nib master I know has that in their like process when tuning, smoothing a nib. But I mean, if you get, you figure a, a pen manufacturer is mass producing these nibs, you know, a lot of this is human work that needs to get done. It's possible that just that one little, because it literally takes like a second to do it. It's possible somebody could have missed one. You know, it happens. So a um, little, little extra tip there in case that can be helpful to you. Yeah, align first, do that second if it's still, if the problem persists, but mm -hmm. uh, don't do any sort of abrasive if you're still uh, seeing a potential for returning that pen. That's something yeah. you want to make sure that you reach out to either whatever customer 
service department you bought your pen from, if you're having an issue, always contact them before you, when you use any abrasive. Any abrasive, any alteration you do to the nib, you're voiding your warranty with any yeah. brand. So just be aware of that. But if you're buying a, whatever, a Jin Hao or something, and you're like, this is even worth you know, following up and trying to deal with any warranty stuff, what the heck, I'll just try it. Yeah. Go for it. Cool. All right. Drew. All right. Um, you know what, Brian? Hmm. We're not even gonna we're not even gonna answer this last question. Good. We're not even gonna do it. I don't say good because I don't want to. I say good because we uh, have somebody else who can talk and uh, different face to see, different voice to hear. That we do. And uh, he visited this very room a couple of weeks ago when he was in town for the DC Pen Show. And by he, I am talking mm -hmm. about none other than David Parker, AKA Fig Boot on pens. Yes. And uh, he visited the Goulet Pen Company here for the second time, actually. Uh, and he participated in a guest Q&A segment. So we gave him two questions to answer and he did just that. Okay, the first question is, why do you think the fountain pen community is so net positive for an online community? You know what, I, I believe that, I, I think it's because everyone understands that there is very little black and white when it comes to this hobby. Um, you know, okay, let's take Star Wars, for example, uh, that there are people that love the prequels and there are people that despise them with a, a white hot vigor and will die on that mountain and people become very opinionated. When it comes to the um, fountain pen hobby, um, that, you know, there might be people out there that just like medium nibs and that is perfectly fine. And then there's someone out there that loves their left-footed oblique soft cursive italic and that that's perfectly fine and that person that only likes mediums doesn't really care it's not like they are personally offended by what that other person likes um, that it's kind of like we're just happy that they are enjoying the hobby and that we understand that it can be enjoyed in many different ways and so i think that um that that's one of the main reasons is because we understand that it can be enjoyed in many different ways. You know, I'm also a, a big believer that if you exude positivity, then you'll get positivity in return. Um, you know, that you're more likely to be treated that way in return. It kind of attracts, positivity attracts positivity. Um, and you know, for um, even for for Goulet's YouTube channel and social media, everything is very positive. And so I'm sure that you guys get a lot of positive comments. Um, if you are someone who uh, is very controversial and takes opinions and basically, um, we'll say rants and raves, not necessarily about pens, but about anything that that's ty the type of audience that you get in return also is very strongly opinionated people. And so uh, I think that for me personally, and probably what uh, the Goulet team experience is that, is that when you are very positive, you get a lot of positive things back. And so you kind of shield yourself from some of those people that are making those, those, those stark opinions that may or may not be contrived as, as negative. Um, so I, I think that if you exude positivity, then you'll get positivity back. Okay, the next question was, is it worth it for someone fairly new to the hobby to even consider buying a gold nibbed pen? You know, I, I think that that really depends on each individual person's uh, unique situation. You know, I had someone uh, a couple of weeks ago email me and they say, I'm looking to pick up my very first pen and I can't figure out if it's going to be a Mont Blanc 149 or a Pelican M1000. And this was like their very first pen. And you know what, if you're in a financial situation where that are your two choices, then fantastic. Great for you. Um, but my actually what my recommendation to them was was neither that you should probably start off with something else a little less expensive and the reason for that is not just because we don't want them to spend money on a pen it's to develop and refine your tastes because when you first start off in the fountain pen industry or fountain pen hobby you really don't know what your tastes are and it takes a while to define and create those and understand what you like you might like medium nibs you might despise medium nibs if you go out and spend a thousand dollars on a pen and you've never tried the nib before then you could be in for a fantastic or a very terrible experience so you know I, I think one of the big things I recommend to folks is 
try not to go too fast when you are collecting. Try not to get penvy. It's hard to do. I get it sometimes as well. But, you know, it takes time for you to better understand your tastes and preferences. And sometimes it's easier to do that and less riskier on lesser expensive pens. Um, that way that when you feel like it's time for you to move up to that gold nib, then your success rate or your chance at having something that you're going to enjoy is much greater. Uh, and you know Because that's one of our big concerns is I'm spending a lot of money on this, am I going to like it? And if you kind of know what you like, then the chances are that you will like that more. Um, you know, that being said, if when people are ready to step up to a gold nib, um, you know, even if it's like in the $200 range, um, that there's a lot of really good, fantastic gold nib pins in that range. Um, you know, you have like the Pilot Custom 74, um, the Vanishing Point, the E90S. Uh, I mean, there's the Lamy 2000, um, even like a Sailor uh, 1911 standard is right around that range. Um, or even a Pilot Falcon. That's a lot of Pilots that I mentioned, but Pilot makes a really good gold nib in that lower lower frame, so or lower range. So one, I would recommend purchasing lesser expensive pens to refine your taste. Um, if you feel like you're ready to step into that $200 range, any of those ones that I mentioned are great starter gold nibs that will help you um, figure out what you do and don't like so that when you're ready to take a step up to something significantly more experience or expensive, then you've, you know what you like and your chances of finding something that you will like is better. All righty. Thank you so much, Mr. Boot. I appreciate that. It's always a delightful uh, collaboration opportunity to uh, do something with David. He is uh, such a, a resource for the fountain pen community. His videos are very, very comprehensive. He does a ton of research a ton of like really good macro shots and video too. I'm a big fan of his stuff. So, oh yeah. Uh, if you if you'd like to see more of David Parker's stuff, he is on he is uh, on YouTube as Figboot on Pens. Can't miss him. And on Instagram, he is at Figboot11. So uh, check him out there if you want more figgy boots in your life. Well said. All right. What we got next, Brian? Uh, hypothetically, we have a question coming up here right now. I mean, literally, we have a hypothetical question up next. All right, Drew, we got another hypothetical from the member of our audience. We do, and I am so sorry. I forgot to write down the name of whomever mentioned this. So I'm sure you know who you are and how awesome you are for giving us this question. But sadly, I am the worst. So sorry about that. But uh, we were asked, Brian, um, mm. this hypothetical. <clears throat> You could have any pen for free, but the only catch is it's the only pen you can write with for the next 10 years. What pen would you get? Is this um, just any, I, I guess any pen, like a any, could be any vintage, pen. vintage, doesn't have to be the, currently like, available. I mean, it's going to have to be an amazing, an amazing, amazing pen for me not to use any other pen for the next 10 years. Yeah, of course. I mean, this is like my worst nightmare of a question here. Because <laughs> literally, will... being 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 relegated to any one pen horrifies me. I would not want to be in this situation. Yeah. All right. but... So 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 like, give give me one answer first. Would you take an out? Would you would you rather have a really awesome pen that you would only have to use for ten years, or would you rather just not even have the best pen ever made for 10 No, years. I would not participate in this at all because okay, I'd well, rather have all the pens all right, that I have. Well, there you go. So, so that's out of the way. So the next question will be, if you had to, okay, what would you pick? That is the actual question. If I yeah, but to. I was curious. I was curious if you actually would um, oh because that, that, that was the question I first asked myself. I said, would you actually participate in this, Drew? And the answer for me was yes. Like, I, I would. After really? 10, after 10, like 10 years. I mean, it would be, it would be sad I, I would miss a lot, but uh, how would you um, do your job? You would... I mean, I could I could handle pens. I just can't write with any. <laughs> so so it's not that still, different from most of our videos. I can anyway. still I can still inspect. <laughs> I can still you know uh, you know look at everything, and uh, I, I can do everything but write with them. So okay. um, hmm. it would be fine for you. That would put a lot more work on my plate, probably. <laughs> Because <laughs> Drew, Drew's like my guy that I'm like, hey, can you test yeah. this out for me? Um, yeah, no, I, I hear you. I hear you. That, um, now, I think we yeah. also might want to um, maybe disconnect this from 
our livelihood a, a, a bit just, just yeah to, we got just, we got a caveat a little bit yeah yeah because otherwise we, we would probably just be like it would yeah, be more no, difficult nothing. for us to do our job which impacts us way more than just like in our families like use. Yeah. yeah so let's take that element out of it just for personal enjoyment personal use i don't think that's about it then then i would have an easier time with you know committing to one yeah though which one Mm. See, my, my thing is like, do I could just go for my dream pen or do I go for the most audaciously expensive pen that I can have? So in my opinion, like it's almost like, do I want to dedicate 10 years to earning like $60,000? If I could pick like a $60,000 Blingtastic uh, Monte Grappa or something like that, because that's like kind of where I'm Like at. a Monte Grappa Pirate or Chaos That's or exactly what I'm thinking. I'm thinking about the Would gold. Would you want to write with that thing for 10 years? That's it's not, not, that seems it's not, horrible to write with. It does, but that to would me, be painful. it's like I'm, I'm earning $60,000 or however much it costs. For like the, and then, the solid gold one? Is that what you're and thinking then, of? Yeah, I think absolutely. That, I think that was like 60 grand. Absolutely, and that would sell it at the end of 10 years, and I would have earned my suffering. It would have been mm. worth it. It would have been, I would, I'll be able to justify, be like, hey, how much did it suck only having to use one pen for 10 years? I'd be like, well, 60 grand in cash, bucko. This is what I got. I need to be able to point to something to be like, that's how it was worth it. Um, I mean, if that's how you're looking at it, why not go with something more expensive than 60 grand? Why not go with like the whatever, uh, oh, there's some like, there's some like Aurora, something or other is just like covered in diamonds. It was like over a million dollars. Oh not yeah, that wasn't that like, it was like some designer collaboration. Yeah, go with right? like the most expensive. Yeah, I think there was one, um, oh, I cannot remember who it was. Yeah, that, that's absolutely there what There was someone at do. the DC pen show that had that like $1.2 million Aurora pen. And he was like letting people hold it and see it. So I held that pen in my hand. The thing was just, it was just, was just it an, was it or, big boot? It was just diamonds everywhere. No, it was a, it was a retailer. Oh, they okay, were, they were okay. a vendor at the show. Um, but yeah, they had that that crazy expensive Aurora. Cuz I know that Fig Boot had a really crazy expensive pen at a pen show one year. Oh, and really? I think so. But yeah, dude, I would go all out because in my opinion, not having to write with one fountain pen for 10 years is pain and suffering. <laughs> and I need to be compensated for that. Mm. And yes, I you know I'm talking tens of thousands of dollars at least to for me to put up with that because it is a passion of mine. It is a hobby. I'm I like pens a lot. And if you're just I'm getting stressed just talking about this. So what you're saying is you're basically like you can be bought. Like, you can be for the right price. Drew would no, do this. It's compensation, Brian. It's not being bought. It's being well. I guess it is being bought. I'm like gripping What's the, the difference? table. I'm like gripping the table very. <laughs> I'm like sweating right now. I'm just, uh, yeah, mm. could, but I think I think about what I could buy with like you know a hundred thousand dollars if that's what we're going. If we're going like blinktastic mm. diamond studded nonsense, like yes, all right, bring it on. Pain and suffering. Let's do this. You would have but to, then who's going to buy that thing? You would have to use that thing for ten years. Like you would have you would be writing with this pen for ten years. Uh, or it would be the only pen I could write with. Uh, yeah, that is technically the question. It is the only so, pen. It is the o- it is the only pen you can write with. So you can't even like pick up a G two and use <laughs> it. You have to write with this pen. Uh, you pick that pirate pen, and that friggin' sword's gonna be stabbing your thumb for it ten years. Like, Drew. It's basically saying, could you just not write for ten years? Because that's what I would be doing. I would just not be doing. Because I'm t- I'm gonna resell this thing. I'm gonna I'm gonna make my pain and suffering bucks back. So wow. I might use it once, but if I need to find some crazy billionaire to buy this obscene pen. <laughs> I don't know, man. The more yeah. I talk about it, the more difficult this is getting. <laughs> the more I'm visualizing I, it. And I'm, just good at make, of, I'm good at making hypotheticals more difficult. Oh, man. That's Normally, you don't get do. to me. You're getting to me this time. Uh, uh. You know, I, think, I think the question is getting to you. I don't think it's me. All right. What, uh, so I think, it's, I think we, I, yeah, yeah, I... I'm putting all the pressure on you and notice I haven't answered a dang thing yet. <laughs> um, this would be uh, tough for me. I think I would I would try to go a middle ground. I would go with something that is pretty special, but also writes really well that I would actually enjoy. So I, I would go you the, would, like, you know what I I'm going to say probably. I, I think probably I do. Are you understand. going with the, uh, the Nightline Emperor? Probably, yeah. I would go yeah. with like, I would go with a really, really sweet, like high-end Namiki pen. from Nighttime Moon Life. That one is pretty rad, I gotta say. Either that one or the Great White Shark, which is Nightline, also Moon, Moonlight, Amazing. Moon time. But I, I like Rodden. I would probably go with the Emperor Nightline. 
Um, that pen, I think, was around 10 grand at the time that it was sold, but they did not have very many of them. It's a big pen, but it writes amazing. So I think I would really enjoy writing with that pen. And it would be beautiful, and it would be worth a pretty good penny. But mm -hmm. I don't know if I had a pen that is that special. And it was the only pen I wrote with for 10 years. I think I would become like sort of Stockholm Syndrome, and I would like become attached to it. And I would, <laughs> I would never want to part with it again because it would be such a part of my life at that point. Mm -hmm. So I would be even more conflicted if it was a really expensive pen. So I maybe wouldn't want to go with, and plus Drew, if you got a crazy expensive pen, you'd be paranoid about like, is somebody going to steal it? Are you going to lose it or break it or drop it or whatever? Like, I don't know. I don't think I would want to go with something too crazy. Oh, I would. I'd put that thing in a safety deposit box and be miserable and mad for a decade until I got to compensate for my <laughs> suffering. And then I would go and buy mm -hmm. a DeLorean. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's your, uh, all right. You a new DeLorean, that? like a factory made mm -hmm. DeLorean. I would, and then they'd be like, you know what? It was worth it. If I could have a DeLorean after think 10 years made, of- Factory made DeLoreans are not that expensive, right? They're like 70 grand maybe, 60 I'm, grand. I'm, I'll, I'll, you know what? If I have a, a hundred grand pen and I sell it for the cost of a 70 grand DeLorean, whatever, I'll take a loss. That's fine. That's it. So you basically just want a DeLorean. Is that what yeah, we're doing? Is that, we're, peeling, so. we're peeling away the layers of the onion. Yeah, I don't, think, I don't think that's unreasonable. So what we learned about Drew here today is he will not <laughs> write down a single thing for 10 years <laughs> if you give him a DeLorean. That's ultimately what we're getting to. I, I don't, this, this sounds like a good compromise to me. I don't <laughs> see the problem here. <laughs> that's pretty great. Oh, fair enough. All right. Can't fault you for that. All right. All you right. ready for a spotlight? I think. I don't know if we're ready, but we'll go for it. I this will be a quickie. We've talked about this enough. All right, let's do it. The spotlight on the Delta 39 plus one. All, All right, right this is kind of a, a sequel to the spotlight that you gave at the uh, start I, of the show. I basically already said most of what I was going to say, <laughs> like so, a ding dong. I didn't think about like, oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. I mean, it's a big deal that Delta's back, right? Delta I think so. It was gone. gone. Like it was, It was not just like, Oh, they're not making anything for a while. Like the company was gone. The company they, was dissolved. It was yeah, fragmented and, it was. and split apart. And mm -hmm. uh, the interesting thing is that Nino Marino, who is now chiefly of Mayora and Natuno, mm -hmm. um, is now the uh, the um, whatever you want to call it. The, he's he's not the Head CEO cheese. of this brand, but yeah, he is the. I think the, it's like the, like chief product designer yeah, or whatever. He's, he's, I don't remember the exact title. He's 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 back at he's Delta. making the pen making the pens. Yeah, he's, he's making the, the pens guy. at Delta. So um, he was one of the two co-founders of the Delta brand. So this is a very interesting full circle moment for him, and uh, so that right there is noteworthy. Absolutely. So Delta it has not just been you know given to another company. It is it is a return to the hands of one of its two founders. So mm -hmm. uh, that's significant because we have seen a lot of popular brands you know change hands in their entirety so uh this is not one of those instances they do have uh at least one core member of the original group and i have no doubt that he probably has some other people that worked with him at delta continually uh still connected to him but probably um, yeah who knows but uh, that is significant to see a brand like that return yeah so, and i and it wasn't just like Oh, they got the name back and they're just making stuff. No, I think it was like the building, like the factory, a lot of the equipment, a lot of the material is still there. From what I understand, I, I don't know all the details, but I believe it was like whatever stage that the company was in, like everything was just left there and they were figuring out what to do with all the stuff. And so, you know, it's different. Like I think a company like Omos, like Omos went away. Omos is never coming back because Omos was like, split apart, sold into pieces. You know, some of the equipment went here, some of the material went there, nibs and other things went that way. The name was sold to somebody else. There's no way to bring all that back together again. Um, Delta's in a different situation. It seemed like it could go that direction, but the fact that it kind of like came back is kind of unique and interesting and, and undoubtedly a part of, uh, now a part of their story, a part of their history. So. Really, I mean, that's whether this personal pen is to your liking or not. I think it is significant historically to the brand 
because it's the first pen kind of of the revival of the brand. So for that reason, I think it's significant enough for us to talk about. Yeah. Now, and if not- you're skipping ahead to this chapter and didn't hear the beginning, just the, the, the quick and dirty of it is the Delta 39 plus one is Delta's first pen after, a, uh, after the company ceased to exist for a time period and is now coming back with a large vintage celluloid, the nitrocelluloid, as Brian mentioned earlier. So this is legit celluloid. This is the real stuff. Um, with mm-hmm. a gold nib, it, it features an uh, internal piston filler and a very unique uh, end. It's cartridge n- converter. It's not cartridge a converter, sorry. Yeah. Not, no, no, not a piston. Um, very unique end where you unscrew the rear finial and there is a brass uh, weight, a very small brass weight. It's, mm-hmm. it's is small but significant that you can remove out of the back of the pen and uh, reattach the uh, cap to make it lighter in the back or heavier in the back depending on what your preference is so um that's what's unique about the pen but uh, the big the big story is definitely that it is delta's first pen back and mm-hmm. we're really curious to see where they go from here they've got a few uh you know models that they have been known for whether or not they're going to bring any of those back is still a mystery we haven't heard anything more from delta i don't know if brian has i certainly have not heard anything about any pens past this one so it's really up in the air but um this is an interesting pen it's yeah, definitely I mean, not for everybody but uh it's not terrible either yeah i think it's more just like uh hey if you heard about delta previously if you liked what delta was doing you know prior mm-hmm. it's more like this is sort of like the kickoff for- Yeah, do you want to be a part pay, of this? Pay attention to Delta now. Yeah. Because mm-hmm. um, this is their first pen they're coming back with. <clears throat> they're going to do more. Um, I don't have an exact timeline. I don't have anything like public to share. I mean, I've, I've been told like, these are some of the things they're talking about intending to do and all that, but it's been, you know, a little bit hush hush, um, even to us in, in the interim here. So, um, and I think actually we didn't even know about this pen until- like I think it was like on the cover of Pen World, basically. Like we didn't get a lot of advance notice on this either. So um, I think they're gonna they're they're figuring a lot of stuff out again, getting their getting their um, ducks in a row. Um, but I I've, I've been told that you know it's more or less they're looking to revive kind of the the design like the spirit that Delta had before. So if you liked the overall design and aesthetics and features that Delta had prior that's kind of on a similar vein of what you're going to see. It's not like a complete reinvention, total change in design. You're going to see a lot of the same kind of stuff. So you can expect, you know, I mean, they had all kinds of, the, the Dolce Vita was like their classic one that they were known for, um, the black and orange, you know, kind of combo. But they had a lot of like other series of pens that involved wood and, you know, different resins and celluloids and stuff like that. I think we can expect to see things in that similar vein, probably, with a revival of previous materials like they had before, like you're seeing with the 39 plus one, I think you can probably expect to see that again because, you know, if they have all those celluloids, you know, why not use them? That would know, be so awesome. There, not, there many companies not... That, not many companies that have them. You know, Stipula yes. has some, Monograppa <clears throat> has some, you know, Delta has some. Not a whole ton of them have them and they're not really making them much anymore. So I would expect the celluloids to only see those on expensive limited editions, but that's still cool that you can get them at all though. Uh, Very. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I, you know, truth be told, I was going to actually like ink up and write with these pens There's seven different nibs. And so I was going to be like, oh, it'd be great to learn the nibs and all that kind of stuff. But the tough thing, you know, we don't have a whole lot of these pens on hand because they are limited editions. There's only so many of them. It's a pretty expensive pen. And just like the way they're packaged and everything. I mean, I would be inking up seven different pens to write with these. And, you know, it's interesting to have a brand come back because it's like, I need to learn more about these nibs. You know, the thing I'll say is like the nibs, I inspected them, they look really good. I didn't ink it up and write with it, but I, you know, seems really smooth, bouncy, gold, all that good stuff. So um, that seemed fine, but like literally I would have to open up like seven different pens, ink them up, use them and do that. I was gonna do that for our nib nook, you know, for the writing uh, samples that we have on our website. But I need to, you know, it's kind of a lot to do that. I have to, you know, more or less, um, kind of break in, you know, break the seal, so to speak, on uh, these pens to do that. And I didn't want to do that with a limited edition pen like this across so many nibs. Um, and uh, I want to verify that like these nibs would be the ones going forward that they'll even use. So I'm always torn when I'm trying to do nibbook samples of, 
limited edition or like unique special nibs because it's like if they're not going to stick around or they're going to change or whatever it's not really helpful to most people so i haven't actually inked up and written with all these but they seem like they're going to be really good um, yeah and we so. need to find out where these nibs are made it doesn't say we don't have it on our website i mean we don't always get told where nibs are made so i don't 100 percent know but we can try to find out they seem yeah they seem to be of good quality though they seem to, yeah. I mean, visually, they look very similar to what we've seen from uh, Mayora and Natuno, but yeah, we will we will find out. Yeah, we'll try to find out for you. So anyway, um, if you're interested in the pen, we have them uh, right now. They are numbered limited editions, so it'll be you know kind of a special pen uh, in that respect. And uh, you yeah. know what though, if they're doing a flex, that has to be Yovo, right? Uh, not necessarily. I mean, who else does a gold flex? Um, Omos used to. So, you know, it's again, it's like, I don't know if they happen to, I'm totally speculating, but if they I mean, got, look, if, look at the, look at the, the, the imprint though, with these lines going up to the, um, slits and then, then down, like that's Yovo. I don't that's know. That's gotta be Yovo. I, I, I bet it. I don't know. I don't know. All right. We can try to right. find out. I'm just saying, Couldn't I'm speculating. Tell Couldn't tell you. It doesn't say it on the nib. So I don't All know. Right. Anyway, so you can go check that out. Uh, we have them in stock right now. And uh, yeah, that's what we got on the Delta 39 plus one. All right, Drew. Now we get to talk about what's happening. Oh. First thing I see in your bullet point is Waffle House. And I just. Yes. Well, I, uh, <laughs> you're probably aware of this, but the Goulet pen, pen Company gave us a half day paid off last week for mental health and i was like well how can i serve my mental health and the answer was quick and clear and that answer mm. was waho and so i went to the closest waffle house to our office here sat down at the bar was served promptly deliciously and kindly just as a amazing magical waffle house experience usually is um and uh, you could not ask for more. It was, it was fast. It was delicious. What, what did you order, Drew? Oh, I always get the all-star special, Brian, with grits, with uh, sausage, scrambled eggs, toast, and a waffle. Did you have this for lunch? Yes. Okay. That's a good, that's a, that's a hearty lunch. It's, yes, it was, it was amazing. Um, but I ate all my toast, so I didn't have room to complete the waffle. So I regretted mm. that a little bit, but, uh, you know, it was all delicious. Mm. So that started off my my afternoon, and I spent the rest of the afternoon actually going to a bunch of uh, Goodwills, just look, looking at some thrift shops. So mm. uh, I was looking for a pair of green polyester pants for my Halloween costume because I have, I have a... a, a a haunted mansion cast member outfit um with like you know a cloak and tails a jacket oh, and stuff and, but I, I need i don't have the pants so um i need some dark green polyester slacks and i have some that i got off ebay but they're a little light dark, lighter green than the rest of it so but unfortunately brian after three different goodwills um kind of realizing that they're probably not stocking vintage men's polyester pants anymore so <laughs> maybe if they not. get if they get those donations, I'm pretty sure they throw them away. So uh, mm. no luck there. But I did find for seven bucks over in the shoe section some roller skates that attach to your shoe that I bought for Archer. And so he spent the whole weekend like rolling around the house in those and uh, shockingly not hurting himself. So All right. um, yeah, he loved them. They were pink. He didn't mind, uh, but they lit up and yeah, he was over the moon. And so he wanted, once he actually got good at him, he wanted to go and roll around, you know, a, an outdoor area. So we walked up to his school, which is actually in our neighborhood uh, because it had just rained. It was a little cool. So we're like, you know, let's go for a walk. So we took the dogs and the child uh, up to his you know, little basketball court blacktop area. And as soon as we walked out, we're like, wow, this is humid, but it's not too bad. But by the time we got to the school, it was hot mm -hmm. and so humid and so we watched him skate around a little bit, but then it just got so miserable. Like it was so just thick. It was like, mm. it was like being in a greenhouse and, oh, I felt like just Frosty the Snowman at the end of the cartoon, you know, just yeah. melting in the poinsettia greenhouse. Oh my God. You know, what helps, you know what helps with that, Drew? Shorts. No, shorts would not have, no, it, mm, I don't. I don't. I don't think so. Pants aren't. It pants was, aren't helping. I'll tell you that much. They're not helping. But <laughs> this is. This is like just 
penetrating your soul, Brian. It was mm. it was awful. So mm. that was uh, that was not as delightful as it, it could have been. Um, but uh, um, one thing uh, we did do was I, I watched Game of uh, No, sorry, I watched uh, we watched the new Game of Thrones. So that uh, there's a new Game of Thrones series out. Uh, Shannon and I watched that mm. on Sunday night. So that was that was good. And then I watched with Archer the Planet of the Ape, Planet of the Apes film from I think 2011. Like not the one with the with uh, Mark Wahlberg, but the more recent one with uh, James Franco. And that movie holds up. It is so yeah. good, so good. And the CG still holds up too. Andy Serkis, you know from Lord of the Rings, he's like mm-hmm. the motion capture master. He did the main ape and uh, his facial expressions and everything. You know, you don't you know who Andy Serkis is? I haven't seen anything that you're talking about right now. Okay, Andy Serkis is, um, let's see, he was in Black Panther, he was in Lord of the Rings. Nope, he's, nope. He's, he's well known for being a very good with motion capture. You know, he wears the suit, okay. that's the mocap suit. Okay. Um, he, he's just super, he did Gollum from Lord of the Rings. You know, Smeagol with the My Precious. You've seen him, right? I'm familiar with the character. I've not okay. seen any of the films, but yes. But that, that's him, all that facial expression, that's all him. He's just, he, okay. he's, Gets down on all fours. He goes nuts. He's so 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 very good. So um, that that movie nice. held up. It was a, it's actually a really good trilogy too. All, each one is just as good as the one before it, but very very different. So very cool. Um, yeah, we watched that. That was fun. And then uh, just kind of got ready for school. We did a little bit of shopping. Picked a, picked Archer up some new shoes because um, nice. he did the thing where we got him new shoes tor- toward the end of last school year. Spent the whole summer in Crocs and then outgrew all of his shoes. So now he needs new oh shoes. Boy. So yep. Uh, I know you know how that is. Living that life, yep. Yep, so we did We did a little bit of that. Got him some new shirts that he could be excited about. Um, we had a pair, Joseph had a pair of shoes that literally his toe was like sticking out of a hole <laughs> oh, of no. the front of the shoe. And we looked and we were like, Joseph, this is like a size six. He's like- That's an, your toe, man. He's like, a, he wears like eights and nines now. And he oh was like, God. well, these ones are more comfortable. I'm like, how? They're breathable. Like his toe sticks out past <laughs> it's the got sole a sunlight. of the shoe. I'm like, dude, no, these shoes oh are done. Oh my God. These shoes are done. You know, we have like a pile of shoes. You know, there's flip flops, there's water shoes, there's all that stuff just like in, we have one like small, like, you know, those little like crates, like you can put file folders in. It's like an open Yeah, crate. yeah, yeah. We have one of those and we have like 30 pairs of shoes across the whole family that are filling the thing up and just spilling out onto the floor. And you know what I have? I'm just I like, have. I'm like, what is, what is this? This is like it, my, my attempt to organize the shoes was like, I'll put a little basket here. Oh, it's just, a, I know how that just, is. Yeah. We have a <laughs> hanging, a hanging shoe organizer in our, in the coat closet oh, downstairs. Yeah. Okay. And I will tell you what this shoe organizer looks like. It's got two spots in the top for my two pairs of Chuck Taylors that I keep downstairs. I have other, others that I keep upstairs in my closet, but my two like go-to Chucks are mm-hmm. right there. And then about eight more empty shoe organizer slots. And then the entire floor of the closets filled with wife and son shoes. <laughs> yep. I feel your pain. I feel your pain on that one. Mm. Yeah. I have. Uh... And, then, and, and then, and then the one time Shannon actually puts her shoes in there. She takes one of my two slots up at the tops. I'm just like, I'm taller than y'all. I just, I just want the top two slots. She's just there's, trolling there, you. She's there just are trolling more. You. She might be. She might yeah. be. She, oh, she she's is. Like, That's calculated. She's yeah. like, oh, I didn't know. I forgot. No, nah, she's, she's trolling you. She's trolling you. Yeah. Oh my god. But, I complain. Uh, yeah. We have, we have one of those shoe organizer things too. We have like a coat closet thing. There's almost no shoes in it. It's like winter gloves and hats and all kinds of other random stuff shoved into those. Because those are hard to organize too. My complaint is most of those shoe organizers don't fit my shoes. I wear a size 12 and I have pretty large shoes. Yeah. And if I have any kinds of shoes, especially like boots, forget it. No, like, no, no. Most most mine don't fit in, there. fit in there. And most like, mine go upstairs, but the, the, the Chuck Taylors, get you can flatten those and slide them in. I had I, I, my water shoes, which are completely flat. They're so long, they just like flop over and fall <laughs> out of the thing. And I'm like- What? Yeah. I'm like, hmm. They clearly don't make, they don't make, you know, these shoe organizers. You need a different shoe organizer. Like I, I, wear, I, wear, I wear 11s and they, they go in there just fine. I don't know. Maybe I wear really yeah. top heavy shoes or something. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah. Chuck Taylors are very, very compressible. I will say that. Yeah. They're barely, um, they're barely shoes in my opinion. Yeah. Uh, this week, by the time this airs, uh, my wife and son and myself will have gone to DC on a little train trip. We're going to go to 
either the zoo or the natural history museum. We don't mm. know which. It's going to be 90 and oh, humid. Go to, the, and, go to the museum. Yeah, I think we might. I'm going to. I'm going to tell Archer that like a lot of the animals might not be very active. You're going to be hot and sweaty looking at a bunch of like animals just panting. A bunch of miserable animals. Yeah. So I'm going to camp. It's cool. But like, I don't know. I've been, you have, have you been to the DC zoo in 2007? Okay. So that was a while ago. Yeah. We took our kids and it was fine, but it's like, like any zoo, you, there's a lot of walking and you're not seeing a lot like in between. Yeah. Like so it is it is pretty cool. Like it's worth doing at some point, but there's definitely like it's there's way more to look at at the Natural History Museum. I think we might do that and then save the zoo for sometime in fall. I would just go with better he was more excited about. Them. He's going to be more excited about the zoo. Now yeah, then do that and you'll just be miserable. Ah! You're a parent. Yeah. This is what you do. I know. I know. <laughs> Anyway, try, and try then, to convince and then, them. Uh, Say like, well, they have ice cream at the Natural History Museum, if, even if they don't. Well, I mean, feel like they have. Eh, 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 they would get you I an mean, ice cream I'll, if you go. I'll to the tell museum. them. I'll tell them we can still go to the zoo just when it gets a little cooler. Like, I, I'd like to go. I just yeah, yeah. Because he's gonna be miserable too. He's gonna be complaining. Like, oh, well, I should have brought water. I'm like, you did. You yeah. drank it all. I don't know. <laughs> but uh, and then I get to get more getting, water. <laughs> he doesn't need water. What are you getting him like one water on the whole trip? Like, come on. Hey, when we were kids, we didn't take water bottles everywhere. Yeah, we were thirsty all the time. <laughs> we were dehydrated. <laughs> we had to fend for ourselves. It was like, uh, I remember, like the concept of bringing a water bottle with you did not exist when we were no, children. No, it did it not. It was like you were like walking around like the park or the whatever, just like hoping for a water fountain. Yeah. You're like, like oasis in the desert kind of a thing. Yep. You see and a water you fountain, you go over it and you step on it and the dang thing doesn't run. And you're like, or Gah! it's, or it's, it's right boiling there. hot. You oh, burn yeah. your thumb pushing the button and then hot water comes out and you're like, this is fine. You're like, I don't even care. I just, I'll drink it's this. Fine. I'll drink this scalding hot water. I'm going to survive. Because I'm dying because I'm wearing pants because I'm a child and I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, the, the only other thing I've been doing is just uh, packing for the San Francisco Pen Show, which I will be going to. So if you are in the western part of the U.S. Uh, or the eastern part of any other Pacific bo- bordering country. <laughs> uh, <laughs> come see me. So um, yeah. I will be there. I will be bringing twice as many stickers as I did in D.C. So I am, I'm going to be prepared because I ran out of stickers in D.C. So come see me. I will give you a pen cast sticker or a cord key sticker or whatever I happen to have on me. Um, and uh, just definitely say hi, please. Um, but uh, that'll be my first time west of Las Vegas, Brian. I've never been to California. Never in your life. Nope. Never been wow. that far. Yeah. So well, that'll be exciting. Um, you'll get to see what a hotel in an office park looks like on the West Coast. <laughs> unbelievable. <laughs> unbelievable. I can't wait. Um, and on uh, Saturday um, evening, I will be doing a panel with CY, who everybody met last week. He has a podcast, as well as April and Kelly, who have a podcast, The Stationery Cafe, as well as Brad Dowdy, who has The Pen Addict um, podcast, which everybody knows. And we're all going to be sitting there doing a Q&A all together. So um, that's pretty cool. A big old podcastiathon. So that's super exciting. So very, very uh, eager to get in and a part of that. Yeah. And if you're there, you can see that whole thing too. And yeah. However that plays out. We're trying to see if they're going to record it. We don't know. You know, we're not really, Drew's on the panel, but he's not like involved in producing it or anything. So no, uh, April from T- Stationary Cafe is kind of heading that up. So if if there is a recording and there's a way to link to it or share it or whatever, we'll try to do that. But no promises on that one because we're not like a part of that side of it. No, I'm not bringing any camera equipment. I, I'll have my phone, so I'll, I'll take I'll take something. Some form of media will survive its way back to Virginia, but uh, I don't know how or what. You got to bring your phone because if you don't take pictures, then it didn't actually happen. That's true. I've heard that. That's right. <laughs> right. Cool. What's been going on in uh, the world of BG? I don't know. I don't know. I only have a couple of bullet points here today, so I'm going to be a little boring. But um, <gasps> yeah, I've been uh, doing some work outside, chipping up really, log, chipping up logs. Yep. Yeah, all this like hot mugginess that you've been talking about. Yeah, throw sawdust like wood chips and bugs and stuff on top of that. That's what, that's what I've been doing. Full that's pants, like being, that's sleeves. like being tarred yeah. and feathered. It's uh kind of feels like that. So you come, you come out of your wood shop looking like, you know, a, you know, a, a wooden tiled Chewbacca. My kids call me Chewbacca on a regular basis. What? Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Or gorilla or, you know, I'm hairy. I'm big. I'm sweaty. <laughs> I'm noisy. I make 
grunting noises often. <laughs> I wasn't referring to that. I was just saying you'd be covered in some sort of brown. Oh yeah, well, I mean, aside accessory. from that, they call me. They call me. They already call me Chewbacca. Oh my god! Actually, Ellie's latest thing. We've been going on like family walks, right? Which is cool, you know, because now it's not. At least it's at least not like ninety-five degrees with nine thousand percent humidity. You know, it's only eight thousand percent humidity and ninety-two degrees. But we're you know going on family walks and stuff like that. Ellie's latest thing has been brainstorming Halloween costume ideas. Okay, and we're like, it's August, but okay, sure. But like literally the last like seven times we've gone for a walk, that's what, that's all she wants to talk about. And it's at the point now where Rachel and I are just like, driveway, mailbox. We're like, I can't even think of anything anymore. Like, I'm just going to list things that I see. Because <laughs> we were originally trying to be clever. And now I'm like, I, I'm tapped out. I have no other ideas. She wants to do something really clever for Halloween. So I don't know. We'll see. Nice. We don't even, we don't even do a lot for Halloween. She just, I don't know. No, no. I, I, actually, I actually told my friends, like, I'm going to have two costumes this year. So we need to do things. So <laughs> you need to do things so that people see. I never, costume. I never request social events ever, but I'm like, I've put a lot. Oh, I, I one you'll do it. Yeah. I, I did some sewing. All right. So I need to be seen. There you go. Darn so, it. Uh, yeah. So I've been spending time outside. That's been fun. Um, lots of just like house cleaning. This is nothing exciting to talk about, but we've spent a lot of time on this kind of stuff. Just like going through paperwork that we like put in a bin, like, owner's manuals and old health insurance information to file away and like super boring, not exciting at all stuff like that that we've been gathering up for like literally since the pandemic started. So I have like bins and bins and bins of paperwork and stuff oh, like that. Oh, is, th is that why all those letters finally made their way over to the office? Yep. Yep. Uh -huh. As part of that. So just like, uh -huh. yeah, we're, you know, we've been doing the COVID life thing and all this kind of stuff. And it's just like, we're just really getting sick of like, all this stuff that we haven't wanted to deal with. I'm like, oh, okay, it's finally reached a breaking point where I got to do something with all this stuff. So it's been a considerable amount of time just reorganizing and going through just stuff, lots of cleaning and, you know, taking stuff to Goodwill and all that type of stuff. So anyway, we're doing lots of that, which is not exciting at all. Um, getting the kids ready for school, school supplies, shopping and stuff like that. But this is, you know, this is our last, last year with an elementary school child. So... It's kind, oh of my a, gosh. kind of a thing now. Yeah, our kids are, I don't know what happened. They're just growing up pretty fast all of a sudden. So yeah, we still have a little bit of like the glue sticks and all that type of stuff. But now like, I mean, Joseph is in middle school and he's doing like pre-engineering classes and he's in like high school math and all this kind of stuff. And I'm like, I can't even help the kid in this stuff anymore because <laughs> I don't remember any of it. And it's all different than when we did it. So it's like, all right, well, good luck, man. What do you need? School supply list? Oh, a notebook and some pencils and your laptop. Okay. Well, good luck with that. So yeah, it'll be interesting. And then uh, my niece and nephew just started school uh, this week and they're in like kindergarten and first grade. So it's like, they're doing the whole like Pokemon backpack and the whole thing. And yeah. I'm just looking at that and being like, oh, my kids are less cute than that, but more reasonable as humans to talk to yeah and the, that, that, that's how, that's how it goes <laughs> and that, that's always how it's gone yeah. it's like you, the younger your kid are the cuter they are the you know yeah well they have to be because they're absolute but then, monsters like exactly just... exactly but but then <laughs> the more you're able to reason with them like oh my gosh it yeah. makes things so so much more easy yeah exactly i will i always tell new parents like there will be a moment where you realize that your child listened to reason and it will be one of like the milestone moments. Like for us, the first milestone moment was being able to take the kid to a restaurant and we actually ate dinner out with him and his little carrier. And we just looked at each other like, we're gonna make it, we're gonna do it. This is gonna be okay. We're gonna be, we're gonna be okay. <laughs> that's right. That's right. And then like, you know, we have those moments, like that's one of them. And then there's that mm. other one. Of course, there's the moment where they actually recognize you and smile. And you're like, oh, okay. I have a connection with you. This is going to be okay. Oh, you're going way then, back now. Yeah, yeah. And then and then there's the moment where they like listen to you. And you're like, hey, no, we can't do this because it's unsafe. They're like, oh. And you're like, oh, oh, what? Did you just, was I just able to explain why I can't let you do something because you would get killed doing it? And you listened? Oh my God. Like, and they're like, that makes sense. Yeah. Oh my God. What there's an hope. amazing, amazing day that was. Yeah. We had, we had something recently, like, I, you know, I you hear about all my adventures. Like we're running the business and doing all this and taking care of the house and doing all these crazy projects. 
like I don't rest basically at all. Like my version of rest is out there like chipping up logs and stuff like oh, that. Oh, I know. Like, that is You're how insane. I rest. So it's like, that's just how I do it. And I think Rachel told me, I think it was just a couple of days ago, you know, I was like heading outside and doing something. And Rachel commented that Ellie just out of the blue was like, wow, daddy works really hard, doesn't he? And I was just like, what? Like, what? I feel so seen. Like, my kids are like, <laughs> realize that like, I'm not just like, eh, around, whatever, yeah. you know? I'm like, no, I'm like actually doing stuff. You know, cause like this past weekend, literally was like, sorting out paperwork and you know we have on our stairs we have like oak our house is from like the late 90s so like golden oak everywhere right so it's like we have oak handrails on our stairs and it's been you know like a while since they've been cleaned so they get that like hand like gunk like oh yeah dark oh, like yeah. hand gunk on them mm-hmm. and it just happens slowly over time and i just looking at it and it's like oh, i've just been looking at it every time i go up and down the stairs i'm like god those are disgusting i want to clean those yeah and so i did like a thorough cleaning got all that junk off of there and it, it was like a solid hour of like yeah. hardcore scrubbing and stuff like that but like that was part of my saturday you know and it's like stuff like that this is like not fun not that rewarding other than like now I don't want to like vomit every time I look at my stair railings, you know, but then just like now when the kids are seeing me do that kind of stuff, they're like, oh, like my parents kind of do a lot around the house. So it's like they're getting to that point where they realize like, oh, that's yeah, beautiful. Like, maybe we shouldn't complain so much about having to like pick up our socks. Maybe we'll just like do it because my parents work their tails off. So that's the stage where my kids are at, which personally I find to be quite enjoyable <laughs> and when they reach that conclusion yeah. just completely on their own it's just oh such yeah. such a breath of fresh air we've had we've had moments where like joseph has like emptied the dishwasher without being asked because mm-hmm. he was like i know you guys are busy and, and i just wanted to help and it was like oh acts of gosh. service that's like yeah i mean that rings the bell for me so, yeah like, it's not all the time it's not like it's happening every day i'm not trying to brag but like you get glimpses like that and you're just like oh you know, maybe everything will be okay. <laughs> exactly, exactly. That's because <laughs> you never know. You gotta love parent. no as those parent, milestones. As a parent, you're just thinking like, what's the least amount that I can screw up my kid and not right. them, like blame me for it for the rest of their life? Because you know you're going to do a ton of stuff wrong. Yes. But when you have moments like that, you're just like, oh, like some good things stick. Okay, cool. <laughs> yes. Like maybe so, he won't yeah. grow up to be a serial killer. Yay. Yeah. Exactly. So ah, good, good success. things, good things are happening. Uh, but yeah, that's been my life. Um, and then like just planning out lots of videos and doing fun stuff. Oh um, yeah. I know about that. Both oh, of yeah. us on that oh, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. last minute planning. Well, some good content coming out in the future though. But anyway, that's all on the personal fronts. Um, I have other like random things, but it's not even worth talking about. Well, I don't know. I'll mention one other random thing. So like I've been looking at just like fun welding projects. Cause now that I can weld, it's like, I want to do some like, interesting things just like express myself creatively or whatever which i'm not doing I don't, I don't get a whole ton of time for that kind of thing but i'm like thinking about a lot of projects so one of the things i want to do is like weld um like chain so you get like you know like steel chain and you can like weld it weld the links together and you can make like mm-hmm. cool shapes or do that kind of thing i don't know why i want to do it aesthetically i don't even really like it because it looks so like weird kind of industrial it's not really my vibe but for whatever reason, I can't get it out of my head that I want to like weld chain together into some shape. I don't know. But, or like, you know, bicycle chain or something like that. Like links of something that, well, I don't know if it's like the repeating pattern or something. So you want to, you want to take an already existing link and then like yeah. basically weld it into so a So take permanent like a shape. chain that's already connected and like mm-hmm. weld it. I've seen, what I see a lot is like people that weld it like a microphone stand or something like that for like a hard rock, you know person you know or like you take a bicycle chain or something like that and weld it into like mailbox sh- mailbox like stands yeah exactly that kind yeah. of stuff so it's like you know or you get like you know if you want like an industrial style like coffee table instead of table legs you can actually weld together like chain and make it you know like straight like a leg but it looks mm-hmm. like it's a chain so it's kind of an optical illusion type thing you could have done that with your uh, spare tire holder on the on the uh, trailer i could have i didn't have the idea at the time ah oh. So stuff like that, that I'm like, I don't know, I just want to weld some chain together. It sounds so <laughs> dumb. Like, I don't even know what I'm going to do with it. So. Well, you know what? You know what would be easy? Like, I'm sure you, um, what about like, uh, um, do you have ladders stored outside your sheds anywhere? Or are they I all do. inside? No, I have some ladders outside. So so hey, ladder hooks, you know, hook them to the. There you go. Yeah. The, the side of your uh, shed. Some like chain, you know, permanent J hooks. There you go. Okay. I could do that. 
But what I learned, so like a lot of the chain you buy is um, like zinc plated. So it's like uh-huh. a shiny thing. But um, I mean, you can weld that, but zinc is not great and it's kind of toxic when you weld it, the gases from it. So you want to actually remove the coating. And I was proud of myself because I was like, I had the cognizance first of all to think about that um, before like welding toxic fumes and breathing it in. Um, but I was also like, how do you remove zinc? Cause it's like, normally if I'm dealing with like flat bar stock or something, I can like grind it away or whatever, but it's like a chain. That's a real pain. I was like, how do you remove zinc plating from a chain? Super easy. You just soak it in vinegar, like white vinegar for 24 hours. And it just eats away all the zinc coating and you're just left with the raw steel chain. And I was like, vinegar is kind of cool. amazing. Vinegar can do a lot. It really can. And it also smells just awful. Rachel and I both hate the smell of vinegar. So she wanted like nothing to do with me when I was working on that. But anyway, I soaked the chain. I got raw steel chain now, ready to weld up some things. There we go. So I don't know. It's dumb, but that's my project. Well, it's not dumb. I don't know. I feel like it's dumb, but I can't get it's it. Pra- out of my no, head. it's 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 still it's not, it's, not, it's just <laughs> practical uh, practicing. You want to just kind of keep on doing your thing. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, that's my weird project at the moment. I don't know if I'm going to do anything with it. We'll see. But I have the chain, so we'll see. All right, I've um, got a couple of company updates, and then we'll wrap this sucker up. Um, so we have a, a video that I've been working on for quite some time that came out this week. Hopefully, we're looking to publish it as of recording this. Hopefully, it will have gone out by the time we publish this video. Um, but it's a full, like, Lamy 2000 deep nib video, sort of like the Sailor nib video that I did a little while ago. But there's fewer nib sizes, which is helpful for one. But I, like, went even more detailed on showing the macro and, like, how they do the grinds and explaining, like, and showing how does it compare to a 14 karat Lamy nib, the non 2000 version. I was going to pair like a Yovo steel nib and actually showing the shape of the tipping and all that kind of stuff. Super close macro. Oh my gosh. It was so difficult to try to get shots of me holding those nibs in such a tight macro without it looking like an earthquake was happening. It was so, I mean, these tips of these nibs, it's like less than a millimeter across the surface of these nibs. It's like so, so small, but to get it to look clear and all that, I feel like we did pretty well, got some learning things that happened as a result of shooting it. But I'm really happy with generally how it's turned out. And I feel like it'll really help explain some of like why the right, the Lamy 2000 has like a slightly different feel than some of the other nibs. And I write with every single nib. It's a 30 minute video. So I think y'all are gonna enjoy it. If you haven't checked it out yet, definitely go check it out since we talk about the Lamy 2000 all the freaking time on this podcast. Uh, yeah. You all right, Drew? Did we- did we talk about it this episode organically before this video mention? We just did. No, we haven't brought it up yet. This was almost the episode where we almost. didn't mention the... Oh. Almost, we almost made it, but nope. Here we are talking about it. Oh, man. Um, and then Drew already mentioned this, but I'll say it again. He's going to be out. We're not doing a pencast next week. Normally, when one of us is out, we try to like fit in one and shoot it in advance and everything. We just did that recently and it's like summer and school starting and all that. So we're like, you know what? We're actually going to take a week off. So no pen cast next week. Sorry. We'll pick it up the following week. And uh, hopefully, I don't want to jinx it by saying this, but hopefully we'll be able to do it back in person again because thankfully our COVID levels have dropped in our local area. And uh, we technically could have shot it together for this episode, but Drew's about to travel and all this kind of stuff. So we were like, you know what? We've already got this process down. Once he gets back from San Francisco and everything's kosher, then we will get back together and get to do our shenanigans face to face. Get to smell each other's coffee breath and feel each other's body heat in the same room. Yep, that's <laughs> that's right. That'll be That's happening. what we bring to the table. So next episode, hopefully that'll make up for us having missed one, but... That's what we got going on. And uh, yeah, we want to thank you all for watching. Please leave us some feedback about how we're doing. Ask us some questions that we can answer on the show in the future. Um, check out gouletpens.com for all your fountain pen, ink, and paper needs. Subscribe to YouTube, Instagram, all that good stuff. And if you want to shoot us an email, if you're an audio listener especially, check out pencast at gouletpens.com. All right, and Drew, my fun fact for today is related to the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco because I had San Francisco on the brain. Oh. So if you happen to see that while you're there, you might, not sure. 
um, had, a, had a couple of things that I didn't even know about the Golden Gate Bridge. So this is all thanks to history.com, like the history channel or whatever. Um, Golden Gate Bridge's orange color was originally intended just as the primer color. Originally, the U.S. Navy had lobbied that the bridge should be painted in blue and yellow stripes to increase its visibility. But when the steel arrived in San Francisco, uh, painted in a burnt red hue as a primer, the consulting architect decided that the color was both highly visible and more pleasing to the eye. And the bridge's color is officially called International Orange. So it could have been blue and yellow striped, which would definitely give it a different look, wouldn't it? <laughs> yeah, that reminds me of like a water park. Right? <laughs> but uh, yeah, so you never know how these things work out sometimes. And another fun fact about the paint, uh, it took 30 years to remove the lead-based paint from the bridge that was originally put on it. So back in the 30s, the Golden Gate Bridge was coated with the primer that was two thirds by weight lead. Oh my God. Yeah. That's a lot of lead. It's a lot of lead. So the architects intended the lead-based paint to protect the steel structure from corrosion because there's plenty of that happening there. Uh, but later learned, much like everybody else, that lead is harmful to humans and the environment. Uh, they used to put it in gasoline and it was in paint that people put in their houses and kids would eat it and then have developmental issues. Lead is terrible for humans. Um, anyway, a massive cleanup effort to remove all the lead-based paint from the bridge started in 1965 and ended wow. in 1995. Literally took three decades to, I mean, oh that's a huge bridge. God. So today the zinc-based primer uh, paint is used instead. Just don't soak it in vinegar, apparently. Um, the Golden Gate Bridge Highway and Transportation District calls the zinc a sacrificial metal that protects the steel from rust. So zinc will still rust, but it rusts instead of the steel. So there you go. Wow. Facts. Knowledge. Those are new. Those are new. Cool, well, right? Man. Very cool. Pretty cool. There's all they if you go to history.com, there were like it was like 30 facts about the Golden Gate Bridge. I was like, I could share any of these, but I don't know. I went with paint because I don't know why. Anyway, if you happen to see it out there, Drew, take a picture with your phone. I'll know. And then we'll know that it happened. I'll know. There's <laughs> lots of zinc right there. There you go. Look at all that zinc. You, you can International see you can, orange. These are these are the facts that you can share with people who don't ask, and they can be like, I don't freaking care about this. Why are you going about the primer on the bridge? These are the things that I like to offer when I'm with people. I'm like, you know, the fork was originally made out of what... And people are like, what? Care? Like... You know, I have all these random facts and things like that. Thanks to doing stuff like this, which nobody asked for, but I do anyway. Anyway, that's what we got for y'all this week. Thank you so much for watching. We'll catch you on the next one and right on. <laughs>